characteristic style, I'm going, I'm going to remember that we're going to go over our rules and expectations before I roll into <laughs> the rest of the meeting. So let's go ahead and do that, Allison. Just one moment while I pull. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to record them. No, I'm, I'm glad you, um, we remembered to do it earlier this time, Tila, thanks. <laughs> Just one moment while I pull that up then. All right, and I'll be sharing my screen. All righty. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're pleased to have you here to strike a balance between meaningful, transparent engagement and online security. The following rules will be applied for this meeting. This meeting has been called to conduct the business of the city of Boulder for the Transportation Advisory Board. Activities that disrupt, delay, or otherwise interfere with the meeting are prohibited. The time for speaking or asking questions may be limited. No person shall speak except when recognized by the person presiding, and no person shall speak for longer than the time allotted. Each person shall register to speak at the meeting using that person's real name. Any person believed to be using a name other than the one they are commonly known by will not be permitted to speak at the meeting. No video will be permitted except for city officials, employees, and invited speakers and presenters. All others will participate by voice only. The person presiding at the meeting shall enforce these rules by muting anyone who violates this rule. If the chat function is enabled, it will be used for individuals to communicate with the host. The chat function is enabled this evening. It should be used for technical online platform related questions only. If an attendee attempts to use chat for any other reason than seeking assistance from the host, the city reserves the right to disable that individual's access to chat. Only the host and individuals designated by the host will be permitted to share their screen during the evening. Thank you, Tila. Thanks very much. Sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, we can move ahead now and turn to um, any amendments before we approve the July minutes from our July meeting. Um, do any members of the board have any uh, changes, amendments or corrections to the minutes, the draft minutes that were circulated? I see some shaking heads. I see no hands. I would invite a motion to approve the draft minutes. Sure, I move to approve the draft minutes. Thanks, Mark. I'll second that before, oh, I'll Alex, you're about to unmute. <laughs> I'll abstain because I wasn't at the July meeting. You can abstain from voting for sure. <laughs> Uh, so uh, there is a motion to approve the July minutes uh, among those who were in attendance at that meeting. Uh, all those in favor of approving said minutes, raise your hand, say aye. I can see one, two, three, four hands. The minutes are approved. Thanks, Meredith. You see the little moment of celebration there? Nice job. <laughs> all right. We actually have a fairly uh, brief and yet very meaty agenda. So it's a, it's a pleasure to, to really start tackling some of these heavier topics and uh, to have our new city manager, Nuria Rivera-Vandemine on with us. I welcome you, I'm very glad that you're here. 
Uh, Erica, I don't know if you had any um, introductory comments or thoughts, um, but we hadn't really um, prepped any remarks in cahoots, but I would invite you to, <laughs> to go ahead and take the wheel at the moment. Um, but I, I do appreciate that you'll be here and I hope you'll stay on for much of the meeting because we do have some you know, pretty significant deep discussion topics coming up later. So to um, tab members um, of the board and you know to welcome Nuria tonight, I think that this is one of the um, first things that you had asked us for, uh, staff, um, as we received a new um, embraced and welcomed a new city manager. So without further ado, um, I will turn it over to Nuria. Thanks, Erica. I wondered how you were going to do that <laughs> from memory, right? Uh, well, so thank you I. so much. Right. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's uh, it's a pleasure, and I know that you know. I'm sure you all have questions about me, and uh, although I think that most people saw the wildly public um, sort of forum uh, as they were searching for a new city manager, so I think most people know a little bit about me. Um, but I'll share with you that I am much more excited to hear about you and to learn of the business that TAB does. Uh, I come from cities where there is a tremendous amount of not just community engagement, but a lot of boards and commissions. Uh, I joke with people that Minneapolis has about 76 and Austin had uh, or 83 and Austin had 76, one of those two numbers. So we, I come from cities where there's a lot of engagement. And I come from cities where I think um, some advisory boards are uh, more, I think, involved in the process than others. And I am embarking on a conversation with a variety of boards as well to learn a little bit more about how that experience has been with you all and um, what those thoughts are as we're tackling some big things together. Um, in particular, I know that uh, I, I've seen your agenda for today. I'm hoping to stay for a little bit. I actually have another meeting um, that I have to get to, but I'm hoping to stay for a chunk of the conversation as you move forward today. But know that I, I probably will be reaching out. I know I've had an opportunity to speak with Ryan. I know I've asked Amy to um, reach out to you, Tilla, and to think about what other members are around that I want to get a flavor of some of the boards and what's working well and what's not working so well as we move forward, because it is vital um, for all of us to be doing this work. Um, in this, you are all more experts than I am in, in things of transportation, um, but it's exciting to me to see how they all interact. Um, as we move forward and perhaps where we have some gaps that we need to make sure that TAB has eyes on other plans that perhaps go beyond Erica's scope of work um, into things like the climate action plan or other issues as we move forward. So um, I'll stop there and say I am an open book. Feel free to ask me questions. Uh, if I don't know the answer, I usually say so. If I don't, I can't say the answer, I'll usually say so as well. So kind of what you see is what you get with me. Thank you, Nuria. Um, you might have seen that Mark McIntyre emailed mm -hmm. a question. He and I spoke earlier. I would like to get to that one pretty quickly, but before we do, I am curious if you have uh, a sense of how uh, formal or informal or frequent or infrequent our reactions as members of a board should be with you or members of your direct staff, as opposed to uh, trying to uh, coordinate things through Erica. I think that Erica probably has a preference for trying to, to coordinate and put out fires. Um, and I don't, I, I don't know that there's a, there's a conflict with that, but I don't know what your expectations and your experience are about uh, interactions with boards like ours. Yeah, I'll say that it is um, in my two previous cities, both Minneapolis and Austin, we had a staff liaison most of the boards and commissions ran through that staff liaison. We would provide in both the cities um, opportunities for staff for our advisory boards, particularly on issues that pertain to them to speak directly with council and we would present and then allow for space for that. Um, here, I understand that there's a lot of conversation happening about boards and commissions. I've been in touch with some of the council members that are on the subcommittee for boards and commissions. You are a body that is appointed by council um, and really figuring out what does that look like for you. That's one of the reasons that I'm engaging in conversations with a variety of the boards and commissions we have in the city to just get a better sense of how is it that you communicate with council members or to um, leadership, in this case me, although you've got a great leader in Erica as you move forward. 
Um, as you can imagine, it's hard with so many boards and commissions for me to be meeting directly with everyone at any given time. But I do think that when there are meaty issues, when there are topics that are critical, um, I, I, you know, I'll want to hear and I'll probably tag uh, Erica and see what's on the agenda and perhaps pop in occasionally because I think it's important to see that. I do keep track of meeting minutes. Um, I do uh, look at some of the other boards and commissions who are recording and occasionally stop in, but mostly it's going to be on topical issues of great interest uh, as that moves forward. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, let's go ahead and turn to Mark's question. Mark, you, you wrote it out and sent it out. Do you want a moment to restate it or do you think you You've got it kind of nailed in. It's not, of course, in the record, so we need to <laughs> uh, right. sort of um, make so some kind of public record here about of what your what your question is. But Tila, we can I'll, also I'll, incorporate I'll, your. I'll take email. your lead if you want me to read it. Fine, but I, everyone, well, actually, the the public hasn't uh, read it, so I guess um, maybe I should quickly uh, just um, read through so that the members of the public. Uh, have a have an idea of what was being asked. So uh, after welcoming uh, Nuria and um, being excited and uh, anticipatory of uh, being able to talk with her, I wrote the following a preface. It is my personal perception that we, the collective we encompassing the city, are good at setting and stating aggressive goals. This is especially true of our climate goals, goals that I think we can all agree need urgent action. However, our various plans and actions from many departments do not reflect the urgency and need for action and change that our goals demand. Our 2019 Transportation Master Plan and tonight's Agenda Item 7, <clears throat> uh, Climate and Transportation Briefing, are excellent examples. We chose a 2030 planning horizon for our TMP uh, climate goals. We have used 15 to 20% of the time allotted to reach those goals, but our progress is poor. And I attached the um, uh, 2020 report on progress uh, report card. My question is why? Why are we struggling to meet our collective goals, goals that council voted for unanimously? And what can we as an advisory board do to support staff in urgently making the changes needed mm -hmm. to reach our goals? That was my question. So that's a great question, Mark, right? Like I, I, I'm recalling and I hope I'm getting this right, but I, I believe there was a report a few years ago, I wanna say by Brookings Institute that looked at this very issue and said, you know, communities all across the nation are like spending all this time setting goals and committing, particularly on, um, climate action and reducing emissions and really lofty goals. And yet the report suggests that we haven't gotten to where we are. So you're not the only one posing the question, right? I, I don't know, and I'll be honest, I don't know yet enough the dynamic of the city, but I'll say that a couple of things. One is I, I, I don't know how many of you saw the climate action plan recently um, and the update. But one of the things I really liked and appreciated about that plan and that update was really looking at going beyond just what a siloed department is looking at. And I think we've got more to do in that regard, right? Like I think climate initiatives has done a good job of setting forth what we're moving forward and thinking about systemic change. But I'll pause it, and this is a conversation I've had with others, um, and we'll continue to work with staff a little bit more is, where are the other departments or other advisory boards fitting into some of the things that are moving forward? Moving forward on climate isn't just about transportation, although obviously that's a big part of it, but you know, doing creating hubs and multimodal and trying to electrify our vehicles, all, all of that is terrific as we think about it, but how does that fit into housing and how does that fit into sort of 15 minute communities and how does that fit into um, some of the other uh, development conversations that we're having um, and the impact on affordability and so forth, right? So weaving some of this, I think, is a really important aspect of figuring out better mechanisms to leverage each other's collective wisdom, if you will. Um, so I think that's something that cities in general struggle with, not, not because they want to keep everyone in the silo, but because we as cities 
um, just you know, we're working on our particular things. It is something that I am thinking about how to bridge and weave the transportation master plan with the police master plan, with the climate action, with housing, like really how do we think about those, all those pieces as interlocking. So I think there's always work to do there. And the other thing I'll note too, and it's timely your question because I was just having this, con I had an earlier meeting this morning with um, our county partners, our school district, our county, um, CU and the city met. Um, and we were actually, the topic of conversation was transportation um, and really thinking about how can we leverage each other in different ways. And there too, there are silos wanting to be or not, but we're thinking about bringing even our staffs together who work on transportation. And this could be an opportunity to even bring um, our advisory boards as we move forward, but thinking about the levers that aren't ours, right? Like the city can only do a piece of it. The county has bigger levers. There is a regional conversation to have with RTD about what they're doing um, in this realm. The school districts, which is trying to figure out how do I bus kids less because they're living closer to the schools that they attend versus having to um, spend time putting more buses out on the street. It's a complex nuance. And I think that the time is overdue to really bring us all to have a good conversation about livability and transportation and commuting and what our goals are going to be. How do we urge, how do we put a sense of urgency to things like development and what is Boulder gonna stand for? So I don't have an easy answer to you. Uh, right? Other than I think that there's just more work to be done to leverage the whole versus what it always feels like is that we're really leveraging pieces of um, the components instead of really thinking about how to press the levers and make it a bigger, um, a bigger push for urgency. Well, thank you. And I, and I appreciate your um, emphasis on urgency. And, and you know, a, a day doesn't go by with the smoke, the you know, just everything, uh, whether it's um, deaths of uh, pedestrians and cyclists or, or others in, uh, in automobiles and our climate, the, the, the sense of urgency, I, I think uh, I, I can speak for uh, TAB, is high on our part. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that from a transportation perspective, um, the, the board has tried to look at every piece and say, how does this move us forward in, in, uh, in, in our goals? And, um, and I personally am an advocate of that we don't necessarily need big grand solutions. We need a whole lot of small actions that add up to mm -hmm. these grand solutions. But you know, every, the, the devil is in the details and, and moving forward on uh, some things that might be boring to others are our capital improvement programs and so forth. Anyway, it's important that we concentrate on all those little things, but I appreciate your sense of urgency and your answer. Thank you. And you're aligned with Brookings. At the end of the day, one of their conclusions was we really, I don't know that we need loftier goals. We need implementable goals. We need to actually see things done as we move forward. And so it, it appears you are right alongside um, some of our scholars as we move forward in this. I think if I could, I would just take small issue with something that Mark just said, which is, you know, it takes a lot of uh, a lot of movement and little details. And I think it, to some extent, we've done a lot of things on little details. And one of the uh, biggest points in our year end letter to council at the end of last year was uh, we've done admirable work around the margins, but the majority of our dangerous streets and our high injury and fatal crashes are happening on arterial roadways. Mm -hmm. uh, and those, that's a big lift to change how those operate, change how, how people behave on them and change um, what, what we are seeing and what we are about to discuss in further detail. That's a very big lever. Um, mm -hmm. And I think another question I have just super briefly, I don't want this to go on too long. There has been a movement, uh, a, a move in the direction uh, of involving TAB more uh, directly and earlier on in certain land use planning processes. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't heard anything recently, and I don't know, Erica, if you know anything, but while I have you both here, 
Does anyone know anything about uh, formal changes to the charter uh, that would allow TAB to be consulted on a regular basis without specific invitation by the council on land use decisions, concept review or otherwise? I don't know myself and maybe Erica knows more. I know that we're gonna have a bit of a conversation at tomorrow's meeting about um, bringing in boards and commissions sort of closer into design process as we move forward. So I guess we're all gonna learn a little bit more about that, but um, it is something all earmarked for my own sort of uh, homework to go look back at what that looks like. And maybe Erica has more knowledge about it than I do. So I think Noria nailed it in one. Um, and I think that um, TAB is not the only uh, board or commission that has an interest in you know, more engagement for actually very the, uh, some of the self same reasons that you just talked about in terms of goals and so forth. And so as Noria said, tomorrow night council is going to have um, you know, a discussion around at least part of those things. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I was specifically talking about the portion of the charter that says tab shall not weigh in on land use decisions unless mm -hmm. specifically invited by council. And we've been we've been hearing some encouraging news that there's you know a, a, a desire to integrate that more fully, recognizing that transportation and land use planning are <laughs> connected and ought to be connected instead of siloed. That's all I was trying to to raise. Nope, I got it, and I have written it down myself just to follow up. I appreciate up on that. it. I thank you so much for coming and joining us. Does any other member of TAB have anything they want to leave Nuria with? Ryan. Nuria, so good to have you. And um, also, I just want to say thanks for being generous with your time uh, when we did meet the other day. Um, I just, I'll try to be super brief. First, wanted to just endorse what, what Mark said about urgency. And I, and I think one of the, um, I can't remember if I would have said this already or not to you, but one, one of the things that feels like a, like a really strong tool in, in any department in the city is, is like, just what's the list of the actions that if you take today based on basically just kind of like first principles mm -hmm. logic, you will reduce yep. GHG. And getting to that, just, it just seems like, like an opportunity across departments, including this one. Um, and then, the, um, I, I'll just cut to the chase. I guess I'll offer one question. I'll make a comment. It's an optional question if you want to take it, but um, <laughs> equity, I think is, is one of these topics that obviously crosses so many, so much of what we do across the city. And it's, and it's, a, and it's something that I think also is a little bit in the eye of the beholder with, with our various stakeholders, including within the city, with, with the public. And it's kind of, I think we have this, this situation now in which it's, I don't think it's very well defined in, mm -hmm. a, in at least some common parlance in which we can all sort of understand the principles. So it's kind of easy in almost any decision to say, well, we shouldn't do this because of equity or we should do this because of equity. And, I'm, and I guess I would just, the comment is, it, it, if there's some process through the racial equity um, mm -hmm. implementation plan or otherwise to just create, I guess, a little more of a kind of a discipline or an understanding about what, yeah. what we mean and what we what counts, I think that would that would help a lot with what we're trying to do here. Um, so welcome to comment, but no need to. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And actually, I'm, I'm happy to comment. A, on that piece, I'll say that I, I think that's why the assessment tool is being rolled out. We're just in the beginning stages of that as that moves forward. But I think we have heard from um, staff as they're implementing that, that a little bit more guidance will be helpful. But I, so I know that Amy is working with GARE, the Government Alliance for Race and Equity on thinking through what that is. And hopefully that tool, you know, I've now been in three cities who've used the racial equity tool and, uh, and promoted by GARE as we move forward. The, the point of the tool really is, is to do, is to be a disruptor, if you will, is to really stop and say who's benefiting from this action and who is not benefiting and who is actually being harmed by that as we think through it. And it really grounds itself in data. And I think that's one of the first things that we as a city have to do. What I have discovered is that our systems don't really um, disaggregate data and we really got to get there if we're going to make some hard decisions that are grounded in that as we move forward. But I take your point and I think that we are working as we move forward on that. And then the other thing that's kind of tied to this racial equity um, question, but it's also about your urgency. I'll say that um, A, there are a lot of cities that use different modalities, right? To move work forward. And so I don't suggest that this is the only one by any means, but you know, the benefit of coming from other cities is that perhaps I have seen some things that, that have worked in other places may not work here. But one of the things we did in Minneapolis actually was to, um, 
collapse some of our plans, particularly our strategic plan and that council approves and our racial equity plan. So they were one and the same. And then we embarked with a facilitator on metrics of urgency to do kind of what I'm hearing you, Ryan, and underlying the question, which is, what are the few things that if we did would actually get us further? Um, and the metrics of urgency conversation, call it whatever you may call it, to me is really a hard look at prioritization and your biggest win. What is the biggest bang for the buck that really gets us further? And putting our work through that lens or something like that lens might be really beneficial because the reality is we can't do all things. Um, and if we do a little bit of everything that people want us to do, then our change is gonna be even more incremental than we would like. So prioritization though requires a lot of discipline. It means saying no to some things because we're really gonna focus on A, B or C. And that's a discipline that we'll have to get through as we move forward. But to me, I, I haven't seen yet a better approach to um, really scalpel-like target focusing work to, to move it forward. So I'll be curious as we in the city now, I've been talking to folks in our and CMO in other departments, if we take a look at the strategic planning process in general, one of the questions I'll be asking precisely is how do we actually prioritize and then how do we hold ourselves accountable and measure it? Because if it can't measure it, then it also to me doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right, with that, I would prefer to move on. If I don't see anything burning from Hutch or Alex. Hutch, oh, you're I, leaning forward. I have unmuted. a question, but I can, I can, I can uh, slip it or I can just uh, keep it uh, super short. Uh, welcome, uh, Nuria, it's fantastic to have you here. Uh, my question slash comment is around, we have council now making a lot of pretty detailed and pretty nuanced decisions. And their, their primary information comes from some combination of, uh, of the various advisory boards and staff, where, where staff frankly does most of the heavy lifting. Uh, but knowing a decent number of the council members, and I think many members of our board do, uh, it, it's amazing how they're sort of balanced on the, on the one hand, on the other hand, and if you talk to them in frank terms, quite often it's like some, some nuance of some information that sort of tilted them one way or the other. And there's many ingredients in what we do here in transportation that are pretty darn fast moving stuff. Uh, and one of my personal worries is getting us really up to date when we're trying to make calls about things like aspects of micro mobility or other things that are technology enabled or other things where like a lot of the climate stuff, which is actually turning along in various places. Uh, so, so my comment uh, slash question is, you know, how do we, how do we help staff who do the heavy lifting and, and how do we really sort of drag that stuff into the light? Some of us are professionally involved enough so that we try a bit, uh, three of us are, you know, have, careers related to this area. Uh, but even so, you're relying on one person's professional, you know, knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I should stop yakking here and say, I, I have a concern about timeliness. I, I literally had a conversation in my backyard two days ago with a city council member who said that, that she or he made a decision about something based on some information, which by the time he or she got it was like two or three years out of date, but that's what they got. And it's like, really? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'll appreciate that. And I think I'll, we'll continue to have conversations about it again as I talk to other boards and commissions because you're not the only person who said that. How do we quickly get up to speed? But then I also want to think a little bit more thoroughly on how do we leverage this collective expertise even more, right? Like sometimes for big projects, we, we implore a device like a task force uh, where we really get some additional expertise from folks depending on how often you meet, on how um, information gets uh, forwarded, and frankly, some of the rules, right? Nothing kills conversation more than like Robert's rules sometimes. Um, so to figure out how do we get some of that inside? I don't have the answer to it now, but I'll, I'll say that it has come up enough to think about how do we leverage amazing professionals that are in community with, I'll also say, amazing professionals that work for the city of Boulder 
uh, in moving forward some of that conversation. And um, there could be other strategies that we talk about, but happy to you know, connect at some point and continue to pull that thread. Thank you. And We're if it's okay with you, Tilla, I'm going to stay around a little bit and hear a little please bit do. of your uh, conversation. But when I knock out, please know it has been a pleasure and then I'm going to another meeting. So it is not at all a desire to leave because I actually think you're going to have a really good conversation today. Well, it's, it's nice to know that you read the minutes too. So <laughs> I appreciate you making time to come with us, uh, to come meet with us this evening. Thank you so much. All right, we will move on now to the next item of the agenda. Uh, normally, we would go to public comment um, this evening. Uh, when we were setting the agenda and uh, revising it recently, we decided collectively uh, to move this next item uh, because of its urgent importance um, to the community. And we expected to hear some comment from the community um, in the public comment. We are going to move to um, a number of recent uh, fatalities and injuries on Boulder Roads and uh, Boulder, just outside of city limits and within city limits. It's been a horrible month. Uh, and uh, I would like to turn it over to Erica Vandenbrand for this portion. Um, we are joined, I believe, by Sergeant Vanderlees from the city um, police department and uh, Sergeant List, is that what I was up to the right? Liska. And Sergeant Liska, I believe, is with um, uh, the state police. Am I Getting this correct? Yes. Thank you. Um, so I will take the cue from you then, Tila, and then Thank take you. the baton. And I just wanted to share with you know the board, I guess a couple of things by way of preface. So whenever um, I and Natalie were speaking with um, you know Chair Tila and um, Vice Chair Alex about this um, particular item at that point, we were um, contextually talking about two bicycle fatalities that had occurred in our community, um, well, one within the city and then one immediately outside of our boundaries. But then um, that very self same weekend, we had additional fatalities and severe injuries. And I just wanted to let all of you know, as TAP board members, that the staff were very concerned about these crashes and the severe crashes and that we are working with our um, PD counterparts to really monitor and look for trends and potential mitigation. We recognize on one hand that severe crashes are sometimes um, or often very random in nature and occur for, region, for reasons that aren't necessarily based on um, our ability to do engineering or um, educate or take other actions in the specific time. But, and also to recognize that even though there's been a recent uptick in over the past month about, um, you know, with regard to having additional uh, fatalities and serious injuries, they're still down um, in 2021 to date when compared to a pre-COVID period. That having been said, that's not an excuse because vision zero has a very important word in it and it's zero. And so um, with that, I just wanted you know, to let all of you know that we as staff recognize that and that we have invited our um, colleagues in um, enforcement, both here at the city and at the state that are in the process of investigating these various crashes so that you can have a better understanding, we can have a better understanding and that we can move forward. So with that, I will turn it over to um, Robin Vanderleest first so that she can um, share with you the latest information that she has. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Tab, for inviting me. Again, it's always good to, to have this meeting and, and get together. Unfortunately, I think this year uh, is uh, the depth of information that I'm about to share is definitely more than we've had in the, in the previous years. I did want to ask Sergeant Liska if he wanted to go first. He's only got one to share. Um, and then uh, if, if he had a, another appointment to get to, he could he could share his and move on. Scott. Well, hearing none, then I will go ahead and go forward. Um, I'm going to just go in chronological order of, of the crashes that have occurred on our city streets recently. Um, and if you'll give me just a minute to share my screen. 
Let's see how that works. So we'll start with the uh, crash that occurred on uh, May 20th, South Boulder Road in Manhattan. And if you'll recall, this is the fatal bike crash that happened there. Make sure everybody can see that screen that I'm sharing. It's a PowerPoint presentation. Yes, okay. All right, so this, uh, this crash occurred at three o'clock in the afternoon on May 20th. Robin, I, I, don't, I only see um, your, your Windows folder, not the PowerPoint. Okay. Um, I think if you're able to drag your PowerPoint over to the screen where your Windows folder is, that might work. Okay. How does that look? Better? Worse? No, I'm not seeing it. Um, when you share your screen, um, it, it provides the option to share um, once. Yeah, so if, if you share your screen and um, click on the on the piece that shows your PowerPoint. How's that? Yes, perfect. Great. I told you I was gonna need you to walk me through just a little bit. Okay, uh, so again, uh, May 20th, three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, bright sunny day, uh, so that you're aware of the weather conditions. Uh, this is the intersection that we're talking about. This is South Boulder Road in Manhattan. South Boulder runs east-west, Manhattan runs uh, north-south. This is the PDQ right here, if you're familiar with that intersection. So the Nissan Altima is uh, 2005 sedan. It's being driven by a 20-year-old female driver. She's um, transporting her female a 15 year old female passenger who's actually her sister. They're both seat belted and they're on their way to a dentist appointment. They're driving in the number one lane, which is the left hand lane. And there was no indication or evidence of chemical impairment or use of electronic devices at the time of the crash. The bicyclist is riding a cruiser style bike with a front basket. He's a 60 year old male rider and he is not wearing a helmet. The bike bicyclist left northbound on Manhattan Circle. He was coming from the PDQ parking lot. He had purchased, purchased some alcohol and other beverages there. At the time of the crash, it was unknown if he had any impairment. However, toxicology reports that he was not under the influence at the time of the crash. So as I mentioned, the Nissan's traveling eastbound in that first lane. The cyclist Across South Boulder Road after failing to stop at the stop sign and was struck by the Nissan. The bicycle was traveling in the roadway. He's required to follow all traffic laws, include stopping at that stop sign. So in this case, the Nissan had the right of way. The collision caused the cyclist to be propelled up onto the hood of the Altima and then he landed on the windshield. From there, he became airborne from the vehicle. He landed partially on the median, partially in the westbound lane. He struck his head on the raised median. He sustained serious head trauma. He was transported to the hospital where he was pronounced deceased. This is a rendition that the reconstructionists do. So if you can see the Nissan's traveling eastbound in that number one lane, the bicyclist traveling northbound crosses over and is struck by the Nissan. These are aerial pictures taken by the drone of the scene. These are police cars here. They're not part of the scene. So we did have video from the PDQ and witnesses as well on scene. And it was determined that the cause of the crash was the bicycle failing to stop at the stop sign. The reconstruction gave us estimated speeds for the vehicle somewhere between 35 and 45 miles an hour. The speed zone there is 35 miles an hour. The bicyclist is estimated to be riding between seven and 10 miles an hour. We consulted with the district attorney in this case, 
and they agreed with our findings and no charges are coming. This is body cam video of the video at PDQ. Mm -hmm. You can see the bicyclist leaving the PDQ parking lot here. He enters the roadway failing to stop for that stop sign into oncoming traffic. Are there any questions on this case? All right, seeing none, I will continue. <clears throat> Sorry, Sergeant Vandalist, I thought I was speaking, but I didn't, I didn't know you properly. Uh, I'm just noting, I understand that the, the bicycle failing to yield was the cause of the crash. And I'm just curious about the, all, the, the uh, other finding that the vehicle was exceeding the speed limit. Uh, I recognize that might not have been identified as a cause of the crash. Do you ever identify contributing factors? Uh, do you ever conclude that both parties, all parties were at fault? Um, so and why, if this person was speeding and was involved in a fatal crash, would that not be, for instance, failure to exercise due care? Sure, that's a great question. So these are estimated speeds, right? And so based on uh, many things, which are can be faulty, right? And, and so proving a speeding charge in this case would be very difficult. And the, the DA's office is always hesitant. There's also the question of when do you give up your right of way? How fast do you need to be going to give up your right of way? And, hmm. and that that question is very difficult to answer, right? So abusing yeah. abusing the right of way might change the the conclusion if that like sure. if you were. And I think okay. that's a great that's a great question. At which at which point are you abusing it so much that mm -hmm. his failing to stop at the stop sign gives him the better right of way? Mm -hmm. Are you are sense? you only are you guided to only find one party at fault? There's, it's never a toss up. So not necessarily, right? The district attorney can definitely make the decision that her speed was so egregious that it contributed to this crash. Mm -hmm. uh, in this case, it, that was not determined. Understood, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, we will move on. So that was, uh, again, May 20th. So the next crash we uh, are going to cover is 30th and Pearl, which ended up being a, a serious injury crash. Um, but at the time it came out, it definitely was questionable whether or not this person was going to live. So this crash happened at 8.56 in the evening on July 25th at the intersection of 30th and Pearl. This is a Google picture of 30 and Pearl. So obviously it's a little bit outdated, but this is the new Google building here on the Southeast corner. This is 30th street, this is Pearl street. So our driver, our, our um, at fault driver, we call TU1, was a 2014 Subaru For Forester. It's driven by a 20-year-old CU student. He had a valid Florida driver's license. He had just completed a workout at Crunch Fist Fitness. He was driving northbound on 30th to turn westbound on Pearl Street and had a flashing yellow light. He was driving his girlfriend's car with permission. He yielded to a southbound motorcycle that was in the far right lane and turned right or westbound on Pearl Street. He continued his turn. He did not see TU2 until the crash. TU2 or the second vehicle was a moped, which was actually classified as a motorcycle in the straight through lane. He, he was cooperative on scene. He gave statements and voluntary blood samples. The driver of the Motorcycle is a 34 year old male. He had a valid Wisconsin license, but he did not have a motorcycle endorsement. He had just left his residence on Eagle Way, which is north of Belmont. 
He was heading towards Magnolia Road or, and King Supers to pick up some medical marijuana and some food at King Supers. He was southbound on 30th in the left through lane and he had the green light. This vehicle looks like a moped, but it's a motorcycle. It's 125 cc, so it's classified as a motorcycle. He was not wearing a helmet. He sustained significant injuries to the right lower leg and multiple broken ribs. The motorcyclist attempted to avoid the accident, applied the brakes, which caused the motorcycle to go down on the right side. There were visible gouges and scrape marks on the pavement pre-impact. He slid about 50 feet on wet pavement before he collided, again with the right front of the Subaru. The Subaru came to an immediate stop after running over a motorcyclist, running over the motorcyclist. The motorcycle landed under the left front corner of the Subaru. The left rear tire of the Subaru came to rest on the motorcycle rider. That vehicle was lifted off the back of the motorcyclist who was lying face down on the pavement by the Subaru driver and other witnesses. The motorcyclist was transported to BCH with serious injuries. He's had major orthopedic surgery and he still risks losing his right leg. Found out today he was at home in recovery. He was at uh, rehab for about a week and today he's at home. We do not have video of this accident. And the investigation is complete, but we are waiting for toxicology reports uh, before making a final charging recommendation to the district attorney. We had a couple of great witnesses on this crash as well that saw the headlight of the motorcycle coming toward the intersection, saw the motorcycle swerve. Um, they get, estimate the motorcycle speed was at 40 to 45. So again, the diagram rendition, here's the vehicle going northbound, trying to make that turn. The motorcycle coming southbound and they come together in the intersection. Scenes from the crash that night. This is what the motorcycle looks like. Looks like a moped, but it's classified as a motorcycle. And then the Subaru damage. What questions can I answer on this one? The diagram shows the Subaru turning from the leftmost left turn lane. Is that? Is that confirmed the lane that he was leaving from? I'm just curious about sight lines there. Yep, that's that's correct. So the first motorcycle is coming through the intersection southbound here and makes a right on Pearl Street. That's where he was focused. He did not see this motorcycle that was in this lane. And I think, you know, sight lines may have, have played a role. Um, eight o'clock at night, it was a wet and dreary night. Um, it's hard to say how bright that headlight was. Uh, we won't know because it's broken. <clears throat> but he, he claims he never saw that motorcycle coming through. Okay, thank you. Yep. But was the rain a factor in the motorcycles cyclist's uh, ability to control his uh, cycle? Well, I'm sure it played a role. I, I think many factors did. Uh, the fact that he wasn't uh, motorcycle endorsed. Um, and uh, the, the rain itself and his ability to keep the motorcycle upright. Yeah. Okay, no other questions, we'll move on. So that was Sunday night. <clears throat> on Monday morning, well, Monday midday, I suppose, we went to a single vehicle crash at 47th and Independence. This one happened at 2.10 in the afternoon. Another bright and sunny day. This is 47th Street, it runs north-south. This is Independence. Again, these uh, pictures, these are Google pictures that haven't been updated. Still an open field, but this is uh, resident apartments now. And the, the, the vehicle owner in this crash lived in these apartments, so he was heading home. So the vehicle was a 2016 gray Acura RDX, driven by a 43-year-old male driver who was wearing a seatbelt. 
We had no indication or evidence of chemical impairment or use of electronic device at the time of the crash. The Acura was traveling southbound on 47th Street, approximately 284 feet north of Independence Road in the southbound lane. It veered left, crossing over the northbound lane and the bike lane, collided with a guardrail on the east side of the roadway, then had a second impact with the same guardrail further south. The Acura remained in contact with the guardrail until it reached the end of the guardrail, continued southbound, crossing over Independence Road into the field where it collided with at least one wooden post and a chain link fence. The Acura appeared to have rolled at least once. It caught fire and then came to arrest, came to rest facing upright north, northbound. Boulder Fire Department and AMR responded, extricated the driver and transported him to Boulder Community Health where he was pronounced deceased. The autopsy confirmed he died due to injuries sustained in the crash. We did have a witness on scene who observed the driver before the crash. <clears throat> believe that the driver was suffering a medical issue before the impact. The drawing rendition, there's the vehicle that's traveling southbound, crossing over the northbound lanes with the two impacts with the guardrail across Independence, hits this corner, something causes the vehicle to roll and it uprights facing northbound. Any questions on that, that crash? Do you have an estimate of his speed? So we do, um, I thought that was in there. We believe he was traveling at or just above the speed limit. I was looking, I didn't see any indication. Yeah, I didn't see it in there either, but my understanding is he was driving at or just above. And the toxicology report is, has it been released? So we don't have the toxicology report yet. That usually comes several weeks after the autopsy. So we won't actually know if he was under the influence uh, for several more weeks. Um, but at this point, there's no indication. He was coming from yoga class. All right. So then Monday night, we responded to diagonal and 34th. on the double fatal, which happened about uh, 11, 20 p.m. So here's diagonal, which runs east-west. 34th Street is primarily an, an egress into a residential area. The first vehicle is a 2016 BMW 228i. It's traveling westbound on the diagonal turning south onto 34th Street. He was driven by a 79-year-old male driver and he was carrying two passengers, 53-year-old male passenger in the front seat wearing a seatbelt. The 56-year-old male passenger it was the rear on the rear passenger side and he was not wearing a seatbelt. The occupants had been in Longmont most of the evening at a community center playing table tennis and they stopped for a sandwich and a drink in Longmont. The second vehicle was a black 2016 Nissan Altima. This vehicle was traveling eastbound on diagonal in the second or the middle lane, it was driven by a 21-year-old male driver, and he had just left work after a double shift. Those two vehicles came together, and the two passengers in the BMW were pronounced deceased on scene. The driver of the BMW was seriously injured in the crash and was hospitalized. He had serious injuries and will require many surgeries, but he's stable for now. And the driver of the Nissan was treated and released from the hospital the next day. So our investigation is still really early on on this one, um, but we do have, at this point, we have some drone footage, we have some laser mapping imaging, We've got interviews with involved parties, crash reconstruction, forensics, and toxicology is all forthcoming. 
we are obviously investigating if drugs and alcohol, electronic device or speed may have been factors in this one. So the drawing rendition and the vehicles after the crash, the BMW came to rest on the uh, southeast corner and the Nissan came to rest in the lane it was traveling in. And there's the vehicles after the crash. So this one, I don't have a whole lot of answers for you uh, just because we're so early on in our investigation, but I'll try and answer any that you have. I have a question, not necessarily specifically about this crash, but in just hearing your um, discussion of these crashes this evening, you've mentioned several times that you've gotten updates about the status of uh, people's recoveries from their injuries. Um, as a, as a matter of course, in doing the investigations for serious injury crashes, um, do you typically regularly follow up with these? I'm asking because it's been raised several times by community cycles. They've been concerned that we're missing data by not directly following up with a hospital. And I'm not certain how well-founded that concern is, um, but we don't know a whole lot about what your standard practice is about checking in on people who've gone to the hospital if they make a turn for the worst and ultimately die. You, generally we'll find that out. Is that not correct? Yep, that's a great question, Tila. Um, so if in serious crashes, we follow up regularly. Uh, the state of Colorado consider, considers it a uh, fatal accident if they die within 30 days of the, of the crash, injuries due to the crash. And so, um, you know, for that reason and for the reason that we really truly wanna know how they're doing and if they're doing better, or if they're doing worse so that we can, um, you know, help in any way that we can and charge appropriately. So my team um, does a fantastic job for the first few days, checking in daily. And then after that, check in every week or so. Thank you, that's helpful to know. I am aware of data that there's often not very good follow-up, but it's often in very large cities where it's just, there are just too many, <laughs> sure. too many that's moving totally parts. Honest. With, with you know, less, um, Serious crashes, obviously getting the data from the hospital is gonna be difficult, right? That's protected information. And so uh, in, in all of these cases, if we're gonna get any information from the hospital, um, our, the people need to sign releases to give that information over to us. We're not entitled to it. Got it, thank you. Yep, any other questions on this crash? All right, two more crashes. So that was on Monday night. Then later in the week, sorry, we just have the one more crash. Getting ahead of myself. On Wednesday, we had the 47th and Independence. This is a bike versus vehicle crash. This happened on Wednesday at again, 210 hours. Beautiful sunny day. Oops, sorry, wrong crash. If you notice there was a little triangle pattern of where these crashes happened. Which I don't think is a contributing factor, but it's interesting nonetheless. <clears throat> so this one happened at, I'm sorry, 613 at night. So this is, uh, the highway here, and this is 47th Street, which runs north-south. So in this crash, a 2019 Honda Passport was being driven by a 20-year-old male driver. He's wearing a seatbelt. He's eastbound on diagonal in the number one lane. He's delivering food for Uber Eats. He's approaching a red traffic signal. There's no indication or evidence of chemical impairment or use of his electronic device at the time of this crash. The bicyclist is a 34-year-old male rider. His helmet was properly worn. He is southbound on 47th Street, facing a green traffic signal. There's no indication of impairment at the time of the crash from this rider. Honda Passport's traveling eastbound on diagonal in the leftmost straight through lane, approaching a red traffic signal. The bicyclist is southbound on 47th and the dedicated bicycle lane, approaching a green traffic signal at diagonal. Several north and southbound cars passed safely through the intersection on the green signal before the bicyclist entered. The Honda failed to stop prior to the intersection and collided with the bicyclist in the intersection. 
The bicyclist was ejected from the bike and landed on his right side, including his head, and was knocked unconscious. He was, transpa he was transported to BCH. He was tra treated for a brain bleed and all over body fractures. He spent three days in ICU. He was released on the 31st to home care. Drawing rendition, vehicles traveling eastbound, bicyclists traveling southbound, they come together in the intersection. We happen to have a red light camera in that intersection, with, which really helps with our investigation. And you can see why it makes it uh, easy for us to determine fault in this one. So with that, with the help of that uh, photo red light camera, it was determined the Honda ran the red light and he was issued a summons for careless driving causing serious injury. And we were able to charge the vulnerable user enhancer on this one. You can see that we estimated his speed between 35 and 40 miles an hour, speed zone of 40 miles an hour. He had a, we had a witness that was driving with him prior to the red light who said he was under the speed limit. The bicyclist speed was approximately 30 mile an hour in the speed zone of, 30, of 40 miles an hour. And so obviously he was not speeding in this crash. Pictures of the Honda, pictures of the bicycle. This is just approaching the intersection. There is some discussion about being two lights at this intersection. I'm not entirely sure whether or not that was a factor. The driver didn't say as much. This is eastbound on the west side approaching. And you can see as you continue to approach, you get under that um, overpass and then there's a second light and this is the light that he ran there. Any questions on that final crash? I have a couple in this okay. case. Um, when you say there is no evidence of the driver using an electronic device, he, he was an Uber Eats driver making a delivery, yes? That's correct. Um, in making a delivery, I, I mean, typically the, the Uber drivers have their GPS up on their dash kind of in front of them and it, and it is a point of focus. It, did, um, is there any way, I'm, I'm not sure, how, I wonder how you reach the conclusion that he wasn't, that the electronic device was not a factor. So the only thing we can go off is the evidence we have. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we did have is the photo red light camera. Mm -hmm. took his picture prior to the violation and he was looking straight ahead. Okay. Um, the other question I have is with that, actually excellent footage from the, uh, uh, the intersection camera, can you, does the inter intersection camera uh, have high enough resolution or frames per second for you to calculate speed simply by the video rather than by skid marks? Isn't that what we did? So the camera itself gives us speed Oh, okay. when they're going when they're going through the intersection, uh, but you can see back here the officer. Maybe it's up here. The officer was able to uh, utilize the video to help with his uh, mm -hmm. with his math skills there. Okay, well, that was for the cyclist. Correct. Yeah, but we can do the same for the vehicle. Okay, but again, again, those are going to be estimates. Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. Obviously, the camera's eye is not the same as real life eye. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Sergeant Liska so he can tell you about his crash. I will stick around for a little bit um, to see if there's any other questions um, and if transportation has any questions for me. I won't be able to stay for the whole meeting though. But again, I, I just 
appreciate you guys uh, asking me to be here. I thank you very much for coming and for doing this hard work. Um, I, I do want to know, you know, what we can know as soon as we can know it. And I do know that you cooperate quite a lot on the Safe Streets report as well that, you know, comes out. It's your regular presence at the Vision Zero partnership meeting. So I just wanted to acknowledge, I know that, that this is difficult work. You're remarkably calm, um, thank but you. I appreciate you coming in and updating us tonight. Thank you. Happy to be here. Sergeant Liska, welcome. Thank you for joining us as well. Thank you. Can you hear me at all or? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Apparently earlier I was trying to, to uh, unmute the wrong device. Um, is it possible to share my screen at all? It should be. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you got it, Jane. Yeah, it looks like you, let me make sure you're a co-host. Okay, you should be now. Let me know if that works. Great. Can you see that? Yes, we do. Um, so the crash that we covered, um, again, it's car versus bicycle fatal crash. Um, so our case report number 1D212180. Uh, Trooper Kyle McDuffie with our vehicular crimes unit is the lead investigator in this one. Um, so with this crash, two vehicle crash. So as, as, I call an SUV. It's more of like a, it was like a Volvo station wagon versus the bicycle. It occurred on Thursday, July 15th at about 6.14 p.m. Locations at Lee Hill Road, or I'm sorry, Lee Hill Drive at Wagon Wheel Gap Road in Boulder County. Again, vehicle one's a uh, Volvo XC70. Uh, was traveling westbound on Lee Hill Road. Uh, the bicycle was eastbound on Lee Hill Road. So if you can picture it, the Volvo is going up, uphill upgrade, and the bicycle is coming downhill. Vehicle one, the driver attempted to make a left turn onto Wagon Wheel Gap Road in front of vehicle two, in front of the bicycle, and basically hit head on. The uh, bicycle hit the front end of the vehicle, the, of the Volvo, and then the rider was ejected, traveled into the windshield, and was pronounced uh, dead on scene. Uh, the, the bicyclist was wearing a, a bicycle helmet. Here's kind of a Google Earth image of the roadway. Um, again, you can see if the, where the bicycle is coming downhill, the vehicle's coming uphill, wanted to make a left turn onto Wagon Wheel Gap. See the yellow line in here? Base, that's approximately 30, or I'm sorry, 300 feet. So it's one of those kind of assumptions that we can make as far as if the bike is traveling at about 25, 25 miles an hour, um, it takes about 8.2 seconds for the bike to cover that distance. So we're looking at how much visibility does the, uh, the, 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 the driver have. Again, it's another Google Earth image looking from the perspective of the driver of the Volvo, looking up, getting ready to make the left turn onto Wagon Wheel Gap. And you can see a little bit of some of the, the shading like from the trees, barely see the, the vehicle with its headlights on. And this is actually taken the, uh, on the day of. So this is a couple hours after the actual crash during the middle of the investigation. The yellow circle indicates approximately the area of impact, the area where the, the, uh, the Volvo hit the bicyclist. And this is a picture of the actual vehicle. Um, you see the damage to the hood, damage to the windshield. So this crash is still on investigation. Um, it looks like after talking to the investigator, actually one of the, uh, a co-investigator, they're saying that there are, there are char charges that will be pending against the driver. Um, basically need to finish up the investigation first before filing the charges and then everything will be presented to the DAs first. Um, what things that they're looking at is speed of the bicyclist, the visibility of the bicyclist, um, just to the so that way we have a thorough investigation we can pre present to the DA. Um, interviews from the driver, look at all the evidence. Um, we're gonna analyze both the vehicle and the bicycle for defects, possible failures, uh, any damage, 
Uh, it's not known if the bike had any kind of a light on it, which would made it maybe a little more visible. But in this case, most likely it's not really a, a factor since the car made a left turn in front of a, the bicyclist. Um, just a little bit of additional information. The driver of the vehicle, uh, adult male, 68 years old, and then the bicyclist was adult male, 39 years old. Are there any questions on this? Um, I have one, and, and that is, did the uh, driver of the Volvo, uh, I ride through that intersection practically daily, certainly weekly on my bike. Um, and uh, did the driver, uh, make, was, were they in continuous motion making the left-hand turn or did they stop and then, uh, then proceed with their turn? Uh, to be honest with you, I don't know. I don't have an answer to that one. Um, I was trying to get a hold of the investigator prior to this and I wasn't able to contact him at all. Um, so the answer, I don't know. If anything, he's either making a, either my understanding from the initial report was that he started to make a left turn, saw the bike coming at him. And I think he's, I believe he stopped right at impact or slowing at least. But as far as an exact speed on him, I do not know. Thank you. Anything else? Do you have any idea when the investigation will be completed? Um, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that one. Uh, Is there a typical to the time? Investigator. Usually for these, these take, it's very unchargeables. They like to get them done within two months um, before we really present to the DA. The DA wants to have all the, the toxic, toxicology from the coroner's office. Um, they want the final, re, the final autopsy report from the coroner, coroner's office. And usually for us, that'll take about two months. That way, when presented, they have all the facts. Okay. And then your description of how long it would take a cyclist traveling at 25 miles an hour, is that suggesting that the speed limit there is 25 miles an hour? It's just like if the bike's coming downhill, uh, it's the estimated speed. Um, oh. I think it is 25 miles an hour. And then most likely, every bike that we get, uh, or I shouldn't say that, it's, it's an approximate speed based on people coming downhill from Lee Hill. Okay. It just gives somebody a perspective of if this bike is doing 25, mile, 25 miles an hour, it'll take them about eight seconds to cover that distance. Okay. What, what is the speed limit there? I think, I think it is 25. I'm not positive though. Yeah, I'm not positive either. Thank you. Any other questions, Tab, anyone? Well, Sergeant Liska, Sergeant Vangelis, thank you again for coming here uh, and joining us. Hutch, you've unmuted. Do you have a question? Yeah, I, I guess I, I've had numerous conversations with local bicyclists. All of, all of us ride up in that area. And uh, uh, almost without exception, they tell me they go really fast down that hill. Uh, and almost without exception, they said they're not going to do that anymore. <laughs> so for what that's <laughs> worth. Taylor, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> and Ryan, were you trying to unmute? Were you trying to chime in here? Uh, sorry, switching phones. I, I did have a um, something at, at the end of the of the individual items. I wasn't sure if we're there yet. Is are we there? Is this a synthesis? Good point for synthesis. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I guess two things. One, I, I appreciate um, the officers being here and doing this. I, I think that it's important. I'm relatively new to TAB, but it, it feels to me that it's really important that we have we have a good sense of each, each fatality case, of both what is the understood cause or contributing causes, and then also what is the, the what, what are the policy implications, if, if any. Um, and I, I, <clears throat> I, I got to thinking, hearing um, some of the discussion that 
there's a question with each one of these cases of is there a, a charging recommendation? Um, I sort of I'm sort of searching also for is there a policy recommendation? Um, maybe with the individual ones or across the the group or group, you know, I just looking at multiple. And I on on the um, the, the first case we talked about uh, on the May twentieth one, you know, there was this. Teal, you raised the question. Well, okay, so the driver was likely speeding. That may not be something that meets a legal threshold or an enforcement threshold of of charging, but it certainly raises my my radar that if if we if we think probably the driver was speeding, is there anything from a policy standpoint like are other drivers speeding there, and is there something to do about it? That's just this. I mean, specific example, but. I guess I would just say, like, maybe this is for this is for staff for for, for our transportation staff. Are there any, um, I guess, po I don't know, policy implications on either any individual cases we've talked about or or looking across the set? So let me try this. Um, I think that in terms of all these um, different crashes, there obviously, as we just heard tonight, they're in different stages of investigation and sort of causality and so forth. I think that as TAB members um, have, so as staff talks about, you know, the Vision Zero um, report and um, et cetera, and the, and the subsequent items um, this evening, I think that, that will give you more of a sense of sort of data based approaches. And so, you know, where there are um, potential clusters, and we'll also be able, to, um, staff will also talk about how we use the data to be able to identify where there are key issue areas across the community and uh, make recommendations um, about investments. And I, I think that we'll be able to have a more robust conversation in that context. I think it's still a little bit too early looking at, you know, as we just heard um, about the, ver the status of the investigations, um, you know, this evening, it's a little bit too early to say that there's one or even two singular um, points of causality that we should lean in on. Okay, thank you. Alex? Sure, first I'd like to thank uh, Sergeant Tiska and Vanderlees for joining us tonight. Uh, you're, I don't have any questions for you because your presentations were rather thorough and answered a lot of the curiosities I had coming into tonight. Uh, the, getting a strong understanding of, of what happened really helps us as we're moving forward with planning and projects and also helps us ask, um, I got a lot of questions from community members in the aftermath of, of high profile crashes like this. So your, your info you brought forward tonight is, is very helpful. Uh, to Erica's point, uh, there's yeah no rush on any sorts of policy or uh, project changes that could help prevent these crashes in these specific locations or types of crashes. Uh, but if at all possible, I think bringing forward some potential solutions would be helpful. And if none are evident uh, immediately and the investigation needs to run its course, I would certainly be open to revisiting any of these specific crashes or others if there are actionable items that staff tab, or um, we could even encourage council to become involved with. And I think the maybe the word of the night early on was, was urgency. This is a, a pretty horrendous month we've had and a bit of an indictment on our system to date. The 30th and Pearl location is a place where we've conducted a corridor study and I don't see much in the way of uh, promises that that can that can solve anything upon implementation. The diagonal is something that we've studied in depth and and spent the millions of dollars necessary in infrastructure improvements, and saw multiple crashes along there. And out on 47th near Independence, that's one of the few places that much needed affordable housing hasn't been blocked in Boulder, and where some. Um, of our lower income residents reside in an area without bike lanes that are low stress or even a complete sidewalk network. So it, this small amount of time that led to us a lot of crashes in a fairly small footprint, all these are, most of these are within a half mile or so of each other. 
I think really underscores the urgency with which we need to act. Thanks, Alex. Anyone else, Mark? I, I have some other comments, but I'm saving them for the Vision Zero discussion. Okay. Yeah, that was also a reason for having this item now and you know here, because it was very awkward to start talking about your Vision Zero action plan. When you've had a month like this, leading up to it. Um, I know that we are continuing to. Um, think about these things and analyze them. There's a lot of work on the Safe Streets report that, that is yet to be done. And I'm hopeful that we will learn what we can. I, I, I find as a lawyer working on this stuff and having been working on it, you know, in the intersection between law and urban planning and advocacy for 20 years now, I find a lot of fault in how the law is written and uh, applied to particular circumstances. You know, the speed limit is a suggestion and, um, there's a frustrating thing called the rule of two. You can, you have to be doing at least two things culpable to really be charged these days because one level of culpability, normally speeding is just forgiven. Um, and where we successfully had city council change, you know, the baseline speed limit on our residential streets to 20 miles an hour, the hope was that that would help it help set the temperature and the expectations for what we see on the roadway and hopefully what we enforce on the roadway um, to make it more serious and make people who are contributing to the severity of the crime, if not the cause of the crime, of the crash, um, internalize that a bit. And we're not getting there. And it's not a city of Boulder problem. It's not a Colorado problem. It's a, it's a national crisis and it kills 40,000 people a year. And I am sorry that some of them are Boulder residents, but uh, we shoulder on. I would um, definitely like to see in the next Safe Streets Boulder report some more like robust um, consideration of particular um, causes, trends, trend lines that we're seeing on these that, you know, as we collect data that will only become clearer, but at some point I don't wanna just be studying the stuff I wanna be taking more um, action on different levels. And that is not, it's not a feasible thing to ask a transportation department of any municipality to shoulder alone. It, it means partnerships with uh, law enforcement, with district attorneys, with prosecuting attorneys, with um, the, the city leadership that say, this is not an acceptable way to drive in our community. So I think the only thing that jumped out at me from the, um, the in-city crashes at least was that one, two, three, four out of seven drivers were 20 or 21 years old. So, you know, there's some element of perhaps inexperience, maybe our failure to, to set expectations to drive more cautiously. I don't know, but um, the youth of some of these drivers to have been involved at such a young age with horrific traffic crashes um, is concerning. <laughs> Well, we are gonna leave it there for now. Um, and I think this is a fine time to move to public comment. I don't see too many members of the public on here. Um, as usual, we will have three minutes for members of the public who wish to speak to TAB about transportation matters to, um, to chime in. You have a hand ra raise hand function. And if that's not working, you can tell me that's not working in the chat. But if any member of the public would like to address TAB, this is your chance. All right, Tila, I have Stephen um, Heidel up first. So Stephen, I'm going to ask you to unmute. And in place of my tile, you'll see the three minute timer um, so that you know when your um, time is getting close. And you should be able to unmute Stephen. There we go. Sorry, I'm doing this on my phone. <clears throat> um, well, first I was going to give a thank you to transportation staff. We got an unexpected crosswalk at 17th and Grove. Um, this is one where we've been fighting for for over a decade, uh, and even before I moved into the neighborhood. Um, so we had asked for a crosswalk on the north side of um 17th as grove crosses it and had been denied um 
because there wasn't enough volume. There was one on the south side. And then all of a sudden, just uh, two weeks ago, it got installed. So big thank you. I don't know what prompted the change, um, but it's great um, just to be able to walk there and have a crosswalk that's designated. Um, and it sort of leads into the death at baseline um, where the cyclist was in an intersection with cross ramps um, and just going home after going to the store. You know, you wonder if the, that intersection, if people have asked for a crosswalk there, that'd be nice to evaluate in the report. Um, and if they have, why it's been denied. And if they haven't, hopefully there's sort of emergency evaluation of that crossing. So another crash doesn't happen and somebody else gets killed. Um, we have another crosswalk on Grove crossing Folsom and right by the, the French cafe there. And I was walking back yesterday and there's a lady walking with the toddler across the crosswalk. And it's an unmarked crosswalk. We've asked for it to be marked, but it doesn't meet the evaluation criteria. Um, but luckily all the cars are nice and stopped. Um, but it's one of those, you know, we need to, with all these deaths and serious injuries, we need to reevaluate especially the flashing yellow arrows. Um, it's hard to believe the Vision Zero action plan, that is one of the action plans is flashing yellow arrows. Um, Pearl and 30th has protected left turn lanes until, I don't know, 7 p.m. Then after that, it turns a flashing yellow arrow. So this motorcyclist life was changed all because we're trying to keep up our level of service at an intersection. Um, that's the only reason we ever change from protected level to a flashing yellow arrow is to maintain the vehicle level of service at intersections. Um, I've been in close calls along Broadway on the bike path after peak hours and it protected lefts turned to flashing yellow arrows. Um, this shouldn't be part of our Vision Zero plan. It's pathetic. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And I don't see any other hands up. Tila, do you see any? No, I don't see any either. Oh, never mind. Okay, there's Kurt, Kurt Nordback. Kurt, okay. I'm going, oh, Kurt, I'm going to ask you to unmute right now. And let me restart that. Okay, thank you for catching me. I'm sorry to, uh, that I uh, raised my hand at the last minute. Um, and thank you uh, particularly to the police and state patrol um, staff uh, who were uh, doing the investigation of these crashes. I'm sure it's very, very difficult work and I'm, I'm definitely appreciative of their service to us in doing this. Um, uh, on this, I will, I will certainly observe the obvious, which is that most of these occur on arterials, um, which we all know are our most dangerous roadways, and, um, but, but ones that we have not taken serious um, steps to improve the safety on, frankly. And every single one of these, I would say, with the possible exception of the, the single vehicle crash on 47, um, speed was a was a contributing factor. There's no there's no denying that. <clears throat> Whether we want to talk about it or not, if the all of the vehicles, bikes, the the motor vehicles uh, were all traveling, say no more than 20 miles per hour, probably all of these people would be still alive. Uh, and so I think we just need to be honest about that. We can make a decision, a policy decision, that people's lives are not worth people's time. But if that's our policy decision, we should be clear about it. We should not beat around the bush. We should say we are sacrificing people's lives and, and people's long-term health in order to save the time of drivers. And, and I, I just really think we should be Put that out there and be honest about it so that there's no ambiguity. So thank you. Thank you, Kurt. 
Thank you, Kurt. And I don't see any more hands at the Neither moment. Neither do I. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks as always to the members of the public for coming in and speaking your mind. We do listen. Uh, we are moving on now to item six, staff briefing and tab feedback on the Vision Zero Plan project. There's Devin Joslin. Hi, good evening. Hi, why don't you go ahead? Okay, thank you. All right, can everyone see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Sorry. Um, no All right, looks like it's kicking off. There we go, we're good to go. Okay, sorry for that little hiccup. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Devin Joslin. I'm the principal traffic engineer for the city. And I'm pleased to be here tonight to provide some highlights of work related to Vision Zero during the second quarter of 2021. Through this presentation, I hope to expound upon and bring life to some of the key items that were noted in the memo uh, submitted to TAB in advance of this presentation. It's important to note that a few things within the presentation occurred since the last TAB meeting and are included in order to keep TAB in the loop on projects uh, with the latest information. Um, just for reference, the, the photo on the title slide here is of the speed kidney that was installed on Cherry Avenue between 9th and 8th streets. And this drone photo gives a good sense of the shape of the speed kidney and the horizontal deflection it provides. Uh, I'm going to focus on six items tonight. Uh, the first thing is to just recap for TAB the items that were brought to TAB in quarter two relative uh, to Vision Zero. I next want to provide an update on Vision Zero Innovation Program and the progress on completing Group 1 and Group 2 projects. I'm also going to provide a summary of the feedback that we received during our two neighborhood forums last month. Uh, relative to the Vision Zero Pavement Management Program, I'll provide TAB with an update on the uh, progress and plans for Folsom Street and Baseline Road. Uh, for item number four there, the additional key updates relative to the four E's, I'll provide updates relative to engineering, enforcement, education, and evaluation. And Within this presentation, I plan to provide uh, an update on the Safe Streets Boulder report and the progress we're making to update that. Uh, item number five has to do with um, highlighting some continued impacts that COVID has had on the work plan and budget, budget process. And then six is to just give a heads up to tab about upcoming items that will be coming your way uh, for the remainder of the year. So in quarter two, there were a few uh, key things that were brought to TAB in April, May, and June. Um, the actions that TAB took um, were related to the NSMP. So in April, uh, you recall TAB approved the project prioritization methodology for the simple and complex projects, uh, basically prioritizing projects by the ranking, uh, one through six for simple projects and choosing to focus on the top ranked uh, complex project for next year, which is Baseline Road. Uh, in May, uh, TAB decided to move forward with constructing the six simple projects in 2021 and planning one complex project uh, in 2022, which will be Baseline Road. So for the VZIP update, uh, you recall that we've broken these projects into two groups. A group one was largely uh, focused on last year and many of the projects were completed uh, last year, although there were a couple that um, bled into the second quarter of this year. But I'm happy to say that now all of the Group 1 installations are fully complete. We do still have art to be installed in the Goss Grove neighborhood 
at the curb extensions installed at 17th and 18th Street. And we continue to gather feedback through um, an online feedback form for the group one projects. Uh, with respect to group two, uh, we had our two neighborhood forums last month and we're continuing to re receive and review feedback about our proposed designs. Uh, taking that feedback into consideration, we're looking toward finalizing the designs this month and we've placed an order for the materials that we'll need to get started uh, implementing those group two projects uh, later this month or in early September. I wanna highlight briefly, uh, just recall, many of you've probably already seen these on the ground, uh, either through driving or riding or walking around town. Uh, but I just wanna again, highlight the nature of these Vision Zero Innovation projects and uh, kind of the quick build, lower cost nature of them. Uh, relative to the second quarter update, the treatments at 26th and Spruce and 23rd and Canyon were completed in the second quarter. And the Speed Kidney and Hardin Center Line at Baseline and Mohawk were completed last month. Uh, as, as I scroll through these photos, uh, just keep in mind that the treatments at 26th and Spruce uh, along Grove Street, 23rd and Canyon, the treatments along Aurora Avenue and Grinnell Avenue are the most like what you can expect to see for the majority of the proposed group two treatments that we'll be looking to implement here in the next few months. Um, so this is again, just a representation of the projects that have already been completed, uh, sampling of the curb extensions along Grove, as well as the enhancements at 23rd and Canyon. Uh, the curb extensions at Aurora will be building upon those as part of the um, expanded segment where we're looking to uh, install more treatments as a means of calming traffic along Aurora. And Aurora was the first quarter that we did um, through coordination with Boulder Valley School District. But we are excited to have some additional treatments there and another uh, crossing enhancement planned at Aurora and Evans Drive. And that will be an interim measure for just about a year until we get the uh, permanent CMPI project installed next year at Aurora and Evans. Uh, photo number 10 there highlights the Hardin center line that was installed last month at Baseline and Mohawk. And the Hardin center line uh, helps guide the path of turning vehicles and encourages slower turning speeds. It also improves the visibility of the turning motorist and allows them to see a little bit better beyond their A pillar and look for pedestrians that may be crossing at the same time they're looking to complete their turning movement. So with respect to group one feedback, uh, not a lot has changed since the last time we spoke with you. Uh, we've received a total of 39 responses, the most recent of which we received on July 14th, so just after last month's tab meeting. And again, none of the feedback has really changed. So 50% of people feel that the group one uh, projects have improved their comfort in some way. 20% uh, of respondents said the treatments really caused no change in their comfort. 15% uh, felt it worsened their comfort. And uh, we have not gotten feedback yet on the speed kidney or the hardened center line. Uh, relative to the speed kidney, we were evaluating the height of the speed kidney. Um, we do believe that it may not have been built to the proper specification. And we're working with our paving contractor to get that uh, double checked and remedied. Uh, but the Hardin center line, we do intend to put out uh, the feedback signs soon to begin collecting feedback on that. Relative to the group two neighborhood forums that were held last month, uh, those forums are available and posted online on the city website. And the, the new uh, link is posted there uh, for people that are interested and maybe having a bit of a hard time navigating the new website. On July 21st, we had 21 community members join us. On July 29th, we had 13 community members join us. And we've received a number, uh, about 14 comment forms received following the meeting um, and a number of emails as well. 
Most of the feedback we've received has been related to the Darley Avenue corridor and the proposed designs there. Uh, the Darley comment forms, we received 10 comment forms. Eight people were opposed to the project. Uh, two people were in favor of the project. And we received many of the emails that we received were from Darley Avenue residents uh, voicing concerns over the proposed designs. So we are working with the residents along Darley Avenue um, to respond to their concerns and inform them of our approach for moving forward and being responsive to the, their concerns. I'll highlight our approach to, to that later in my presentation, um, but just to give you a sense of the main concerns that they had with our proposed designs, uh, the concerns were focused on the removal of on-street parking, uh, creating a shared lane condition for cars and bikes, as well as some concerns about snow removal. Uh, there also seemed to be some confusion along Darley Avenue between the difference of VZIP interim treatments and the NSMP petition process and the ultimate permanent traffic calming project that they would receive. So we've been working with the residents to clarify that process and the difference between the two. Um, there are some people along Darley that uh, feel speed cushions are really the only acceptable treatment. Um, and some of them are asking to have their names removed from the NSMP petition that was completed a few years ago, uh, unless they can have some certainty that speed cushions would be the, the treatment installed. And again, we've been working with those residents individually uh, to respond to and address those concerns. Some other folks were very appreciative of the projects and were thankful for the quick build low cost projects that could be installed sooner rather than later. Uh, there were some concerns expressed about the delineator posts being knocked over and either the treatment losing effectiveness or just not really looking as nice. And there were questions about how responsive city staff could be to making those repairs uh, if posts were knocked down. Um, on Glenwood and Palo, uh, the, the feedback has generally been positive and folks seem to be excited about the proposed treatments. We had a few comments along the Aurora Avenue corridor that were asking about the cost of the treatments uh, as well as a few more details of the designs. I think on our one of our design exhibits, we had uh, an error in our uh, design at Evans and it appeared as though we were going to be narrowing Evans to um, a one lane road, which is not the case. Uh, Evans will remain a two way uh, traffic intersecting Aurora. So we clarified that with the, the person who asked that question. Uh, and again, we're looking to uh, provide a revised set of designs uh, for the residents along Darley Avenue to consider and uh, again, react to and provide feedback on. And we'll be doing that uh, throughout this month. So relative to some of the other uh, group two projects that aren't uh, focusing on traffic calming or the NSMP corridors, there was a design for a curb extension proposed at the intersection of 20th and Grove. And that was presented at the Goss Grove Neighborhood Association meeting on July 20th. And feedback was generally positive. So we're planning to move forward with that. We are also proposing a few uh, crossing enhancements along Spine Road near Chaparral Court, and we did not receive any feedback, uh, negative or positive, relative to that throughout this feedback process. Uh, so we're planning to move forward with those as well. Um, regarding the treatment planned at 10th and University, um, staff took a closer look at that treatment and decided to revise the design a bit in order to retain more on-street parking. Uh, we're also planning to mark uh, that intersection with marked crosswalks at all four legs of the intersection, uh, not just the east and west legs crossing University.
And those crossings are uh, warranted in accordance with our pedestrian crossing treatment installation guidelines. I just wanted to highlight as well that Ninth and Balsam and Ninth and Cedar have been um, prepped and they are planned to get artistic crosswalks uh, later this year. Staff's in the process of coordinating uh, with the artists to refine designs and develop a schedule for completing that art. Uh, when I say that uh, the intersection has been prepped, uh, this photo indicates what that means. Uh, basically, the, the parallel bars have been put down, uh, creating the canvas on which the art can be uh, placed in between the crosswalk. Uh, there are a few other crossing treatments at 9th and Cascade and Folsom and Hawthorne Street, which we have uh, been looking at designs for, and those designs are advancing. Um, 9th and Cascade, we have a design for some curb extensions using paint and delineator posts, and that one will likely be done um, sooner than later since the curb ramps at that intersection are already upgraded. Uh, but Folsom Street and Hawthorne, we need to make a few curb ramp upgrades uh, before marking and signing the crosswalk and installing the uh, paint and post curb extensions. Um, this is an update. These photos are hot off the press. Um, they happened this weekend. Um, the intersection of 19th and Avocado and 19th and Yarmouth. Um, the community came out in full force and uh, helped complete the art of these intersections uh, this past weekend. And the finished designs, as you can see, are quite vibrant and colorful. And I think uh, the community was very supportive and uh, really the project got done uh, quicker than anyone expected because of the strong community support. Um, 19th and Yarmouth, uh, I guess officially marks our first group two project that we can check off the list. Um, 19th and Avocado was separate from the Vision Zero Innovation Program. Uh, it was funded through a Can Do Colorado grant. Um, but one of the goals of that grant was to really bring the community together uh, during COVID. And uh, we feel we achieved that goal based on the way people came out to help. Devin, those are beautiful. I'm glad you included that slide. Um, I just want to make sure, I know we handed you the baton about 20 minutes late, but I just want to make sure we'll have time to get through your presentation and not get any feedback in. So. Okay, thank you. We can pick it up a little bit. Probably about five more minutes. Thanks. The group two timeline uh, is shown here. Again, we, we plan to begin implementation later this month uh, in early September. Um, we expect that that implementation may, may drag all the way into November, um, but as we install treatments, we will plan to evaluate them. So for Darley, we have a little bit different approach, again, to be sensitive and respond to that feedback that we got from the community. So we are planning to revise the design and uh, receive feedback on the revised design from the community this month, and then in September, we'll decide whether or not to proceed. I think one of the options is to uh, do nothing and, and leave the option of the NSMP more permanent project on the table. Uh, it may be that we also uh, reach a, a common ground with the revised designs. So relative to the, the Vision Zero Pavement Management Program, uh, you'll recall that we, we came to you with uh, plans for Folsom Street and Baseline Road. Uh, Folsom was milled last week. The milling is complete. Um, and they're planning to begin paving operations uh, this week. And we expect that it'll take about a week to complete the paving. Uh, but I want to provide again just a, a more detailed update on the design and staff's thinking for how Folsom will evolve uh, from the interim condition to the ultimate condition. Uh, so the inter interim cross section is shown. This is after paving, but before the new curb. Uh, basically, it's returning to the existing condition minus uh, striping in the buffer. Um, and the reason we're not including the buffer hatching for the interim condition is because it would, would look out of place once the curb is ultimately installed within the buffer area. 
Uh, the ultimate cross section is shown here, same dimensions for the striping as the interim condition, uh, but there will be a six inch high curb uh, placed between the bike lane and the travel lane within the buffer area. And we're planning to put uh, flexible delineator posts on the curb at 40 foot intervals. And we'll do uh, three closely spaced delineators as you approach and depart, depart each intersection. Uh, we're also planning to do green conflict markings and enhanced signing. Um, the green conflict markings will be placed across public streets and in the transition areas along the corridor. Uh, the, the curve that we are choosing to go with uh, will look very much like the example shown here from Fort Collins along West Mulberry Street. Um, this curve has a similar uh, profile to it as the one we're planning to use. Of note here, the gaps in the curb, um, we may not end up with gaps uh, in quite the same areas as shown here. Uh, the gaps in our curb will be determined by the drainage analysis. Again, just to reiterate the timeline here, we're expecting it to take one week uh, to complete the paving. That interim cross section will be installed after the paving. Uh, the thing to note here is that the concrete work timeline is uh, still to be determined. Uh, we've reached out to our local concrete contractors and we're trying to get a better sense of when they can install the curb. Uh, baseline road, there is not uh, a lot new to update here. Uh, the milling is not planned to start until at least after CU move in, uh, which is kind of next week, the 15th through 22nd. Um, these next items just highlight the changes relative to the four E's. Um, I wanted to give you some visuals here of what it means when we refer to traffic signal changes. So these highlight primarily flashing yellow arrow uh, indications that were installed um, at some intersections recently. And recall that a flashing yellow arrow, a four section indication can run both the flashing yellow arrow as well as protected only uh, left turn phasing. So it does provide that flexibility. So this is just the change at Arapahoe and Folsom before and after, as well as at Broadway and Arapahoe. Some other things relative to engineering are the DCS update. Uh, work is underway on that. Uh, we've also been refining designs for the community mobility planning and implementation crossings uh, at 15th and Iris, Colorado, east of 33rd, and Aurora and Evans. Uh, and we're planning to discuss both of those items with you next month. Uh, the Green Streets, we're looking at some ongoing community engagement and planning to come to tab with that in November. Uh, so with enforcement, uh, not a lot of updates here as well. No new red light cameras are planned to be installed this year. And the summary report of uh, photo red light uh, enforcement will be available uh, in early 22, early 2022. Uh, so relative to education, um, just wanted to highlight a few things that have occurred here, um, trying to remain as active as we can. Um, the, the bottom item there is, is probably the thing most of note in response to the recent crashes. We did want to look at launching a traffic safety campaign this month. Uh, so we're in the process of determining the messaging and distribution channels for that. Uh, the Safe Streets Boulder report, the update is uh, underway. We're planning to complete the crash analysis and mapping um, within the next two months. Uh, prepare the draft report after that and planning to come to tab in October and possibly November uh, to receive feedback on the update. Um, the, the deadline is that we are preparing for a council study session on December 7th. Uh, so by December 7th, we will have uh, a draft report ready to present uh, to council. So with the impacts of COVID, uh, the thing to highlight here is that the 2022 budget does include some additional requests for transportation CIP, uh, as well as Vision Zero capital improvements, uh, such as the pavement management program and some signal system upgrades all in support of the Vision Zero goals. Uh, future tab agenda items are listed here as we know them now, and uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Devin.
I will open it up to questions from Tab. Any moment, thanks, that helps me see, I appreciate that. Uh, any member of Tab wanna jump in here, have any questions or feedback for Devin? Mark, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> in light of uh, the number of left turn injuries and deaths uh, we've experienced, and not all of them are at signalized intersections, but I had my own close call, which I've uh, shared with all of those on the tab email list at a uh, permissive left arrow. I, I, my question is, have we ever undertaken the task of calculating the, um, for lack of a better word, loss of service, and I and I I know that that's not a word that the that the board likes, but it, it is a, a metric. Uh, the total loss of service, if we just made all signalized left hand turns protected. To my knowledge, we have not studied that in depth to understand the implications of changing left turn phasing to protect only at all times at all intersections within the city. Do you know of any community that has such a uh, policy or has implemented that? I do not know of one off the top of my head, but I'm sure that is something we could research. Well, Boulder could be first. <laughs> Okay. Um, uh, the other one that has come up for me, and, and I noticed it in the presentation, flashing yellow arrows for right turns. Do they exist anywhere in Boulder in a functional, I know that they, you're, you're planning for them at Broadway and Rayleigh. Do they exist anywhere else in a functioning state? They do not, no. So Broadway and Rayleigh is planned on being the first. It is, correct. But it is, and, and that's not an experiment per se, that is the first of a plan to actually add flashing yellow, permissive flashing yellow arrows for right turns at other intersections? That is something that staff is considering doing. Okay. Um, and finally, in the project list, uh, I didn't see the traffic circle and I, forgive me, you gave me the, the drawing with the street location. I, I don't have it here in front of me at the moment. You didn't have the traffic circle in the project list uh, that you and Ryan and I met on. Uh, where is that traffic circle and what is its status? That traffic circle is planned to be installed at Aurora and 35th. And we did not receive any negative feedback relative to that proposed design. So it would be one that we are planning to move forward with in the next month or two. Okay. And, and just to summarize my feedback uh, from our meeting, which was super helpful to me, and I really appreciate you and Ryan taking the time to meet that the design as, as it was presented to me at the time, which was very similar to the design at uh, 23rd and Pine, uh, 23rd and Mapleton, et cetera. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, from, it's a design that's very similar to what we have currently. I'm, I need to be on record. That is an ineffective design, ineffective design as a traffic calming device because of the radii is too small and the amount of deflection is too small. So I just, I wanna state that and, and hope that, um, and Ryan was kind of encouraging, but I, he couldn't commit to anything that through either uh, ramped curbs or some other feature, we could both uh, increase the radii and increase the degree of deflection. Correct, and at Aurora and 35th, we are, 
doing that traffic circle in combination with curb extensions to put motorists more toward the center and create that deflection outward around the circle. Okay. All right, thank you. I may have missed that. What project is that a part of or funding program? That is one of the treatments we're proposing along Aurora in conjunction with the Vision Zero Innovation Program. Okay, the second group. Okay, right, thanks. So it's a temporary traffic circle? circle? Correct. And okay. In full transparency, we are reviewing some options for how the circle could be built. Okay. Uh, a few different material types we could are considering. Okay. Anyone else, Tab? Questions, feedback for Devin? Ryan, go ahead. Ryan, figure out your microphone issues. My apologies. <laughs> you got this. Uh, apologies. Um, Devin, thank you. I have one, uh, one comment and one question. Um, on the comment, thinking to the previous item on, on recent traffic fatalities and, and serious injuries, um, I, I feel like big picture, two of the most important things that TAB should be weighing in on are strategic planning overall, just the various aspects of, of big picture planning and thinking. And then secondly, if there's a, a, if there's a catastrophe that in which we, it, it has not worked and that's fatalities and serious injuries. And um, I, I guess I'm, I'm just thinking when I look at the, at the Vision Zero plan and some of the, the references of the, of the crash reports before it, one thing that I, I feel like could add um, usefully to our dialogue here, and by the way, I thought it was a super productive discussion earlier with, with the officers to hear, hear about the reports. I feel like it's, it's important for us to have um, that kind of organization going forward, sort of case by case on, on, on the big ones. And I'm just, I'm imagining, you know, I don't know if it goes in this, this same memo that we, that we have, you know, when, when we need to do these kind of updates, but something like a table in which we, we can just really clearly look at um, maybe there's three columns. The first column is here's here's the here was the um, the incident or the crash the, the, with the fatality or serious injury. Next one is here's the the you know determined causes or contributing causes. And then the third one is um, what are the policy implications? You know after after some consideration and just something for us as a, as a tab. I think you know we owe city council our our views on on how things are working. I think I think we need something like that going forward. I think it would also just contribute to a healthy dialogue. So I just want to offer that as, as a comment. Um, and then the question is um, also just reflecting on that previous item, it just, it's, you know, just hearing the, the, um, the reconstruction of the, different, um, of the different crashes, it just jumps out how important the, the, the data is here. And there's a lot of this forensics work that has to happen. And at each one, we're, we're gosh, we're really hoping for video footage and video cameras. And, and I'm just wondering if there's, um, if there's anything we can or should do more to create a more distributed use of video around the city, there's probably this probably considered and has a whole bunch of you know concerns and considerations. But I'm just wondering what is there a role to to, to increase more of the visual you know video footage um, and or are there obstacles that stand in the way of that? I'm thinking because that is a very it's a good question, but it's, it has a lot of parts to it. Um, I think relative to expanded use of video within the city, I can tell you that as part of a grant we received through uh, the doc, Dr. Fogg, uh, we are planning to install many more closed circuit television cameras at intersections that will give us surveillance of the intersections. Uh, typically those cameras though do not record, they just provide a live stream of the intersection. Does anything prevent the city from recording that stream in a separate place? Are there like ACLU kind of concerns or? Right. I understand I, there might be a limitation of that camera, but if we're streaming it somewhere. Yeah, I know other agencies, I think, do have that ability. Uh, so I would need to check into what, what it would take. I'm not sure of, of what it takes off the top line. Devin, thanks. And as I'm saying it, I, I haven't, I mean, I'm just sort of came to me. I could imagine there's all kinds of equity and other issues that I've not, have not thought of. So I'm not saying this is like, this is, 
I don't know the solution. I've just sort of, I'm taken by the, looking at these reports that gosh, wish there was more video and hope I have video when I might, when I have problems. So anyway, okay, thanks for that. Thanks, anyone else, Tab? Um, I appreciate the report, Devin. I really liked how the memo tied a bunch of these things into actual numbered items on the, on the Vision Zero Action Plan. Um, I think that's one of the large deficits on the TMP action plan is it's hard to tell when what we're doing what and, and it's not numbered, it's hard to refer to. My question really is, um, I know that parts of the Vision Zero Action Plan we identified also, uh, not just like near-term feasibility of some of these, these items, but uh, impact, like what would be a really impactful uh, change to make? Um, like focusing on the left turn arrows, protected phasing was a big one. Um, is there anything that comes to mind that we have left on the table that we're not really working on that would be one of those high impact things in the Vision Zero Action Plan that we should be maybe help, helping push forward onto the work plan in the next year or two? One thing that comes to mind relative to that that we are looking at closely is the interactions um, at multi-use path crossings and how we sign and mark those and convey information to all users. Uh, I think there's been some challenges at multi-use path crossings with right turns from the intersecting streets where the person who's turning right is looking left and they begin their turn without looking to the right. And there could be someone on the multi-use path um, approaching from the right that they do not see. Uh, so I think that's one thing that staff in particular wants to uh, take a close look at with this, this update of the Safe Streets Report. Okay, thank you. Anyone else before we let Devin go? Lovely, thank you Devin for your time. Thank you. Yeah, sure thing. All right, we're moving on now to the staff briefing and tab feedback on climate and transportation, item seven on the agenda. Erica is going to lead this one. So um, I will introduce Chris Haglin, um, who okay. has been the um, key person that has been the liaison with our climate and sustainability folks and um, to share the presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Erica. Let me get my presentation going. Can you see the PowerPoint? We can. All right, so now I just gotta go to the slideshow. Do you have the slideshow now? Yes, you do. All right, excellent, thank you. And I am, I'm gonna apologize. I do have to turn my camera off because I'm worried about my bandwidth. Um, I have a lot of kids at home on electronics, <laughs> but good evening, Tab. Um, my name is Chris Haglin. I'm the Acting Transportation Planning Manager for Transportation and Mobility. I am joined here tonight with a number of my colleagues from Climate Initiatives. I believe I have Jonathan, Cohen, Matt, and Lauren all here with me from the team. And they will be here and able to help answer any of your questions. Uh, the purpose of tonight's presentation is to provide a briefing on our shared transportation and climate efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So I will be reviewing with you our climate and transportation goals how we conduct our GHD analysis, our past achievements, and discuss our future focus areas uh, to build on both our past successes, take advantage of opportunities, and overcome the many challenges that we face. According to the 2019 Greenhouse Gas Inventory for the city, approximately 29% of all GHD emissions stem from transportation-related activities. The majority of the city's emissions are the result of the he heating and cooling of residential and commercial buildings. Recently, uh, the updated Climate Action Plan calls for a 70% reduction for all GHG emissions, and specifically for transportation-related emissions, 
the goal is to reduce the portion of transportation specific GHG by 50% from its 2005 baseline. According to the 2019 inventory, progress toward this goal is evident with a reduction citywide of 21% and for transportation specific emissions, a 15% reduction from our 2005 baseline. I did want to apologize for accidentally transposing numbers uh, for the citywide GHG goal in the memo and in the initial presentation that was shared. I mistakenly used the reduction total uh, rather than the target uh, in those things, just transposing those two numbers. And I would like to thank Tila for noticing uh, my error. And so it's been corrected in this slide. When we look at reducing our transportation related emissions, we focus on three sectors. VMT reduction through changes in travel behavior and modal shift of trips away from vehicle trips. The impacts of increased fuel efficiency standards or federal cafe standards for automobiles and trucks that reduce emissions per vehicle mile of travel. And emission reductions from electrification of vehicles through technological advancements and seen in our electric vehicle adoption rates. Uh, it is projected that approximately half of the transportation related emission reductions will likely come from electrification. There are a variety of ways that we can measure GHG emissions uh, with each of each with different assumptions, different methodologies. Uh, the city has selected to use the ICLEI methodology uh, for transportation. One of the key points of this methodology is that all the travel within Boulder uh, is counted along with half of the vehicle miles traveled of trips that enter or leave the city for work trips uh, by either residents or non-resident employees. Uh, over the years, the city has relied on a variety of data sources to estimate VMT, uh, which is then converted to GHG with emission factors. For our overall annual and daily VMT figures, the city has typically relied on Dr. Cog's regional travel model, which estimates total trips in and out and within Boulder and the distances those of, of distance traveled. Uh, the city's transportation department has been using this data since the early 90s, uh, and for the past DMPs, 1994 uh, had been used at the base, as the baseline. For many years, the goal was to keep VMT steady uh, despite growth in population and employment, which we have seen significant growth uh, since that time. Uh, with this increased emphasis on meeting climate goals, uh, the goal was shifted to a VMT reduction of 20% by 2030 with the last TMP update. Uh, as you may also know, the city has been conducting surveys of both residents and employees since 1990 and 1991, respectively. Uh, we have used trip data and VMT data uh, from the survey as a check on Dr. Cog's regional travel model, uh, but also to track the VMT per capita uh, objective that was introduced into our more recent TMP uh, for both residents for all trips and for work trips by non-resident employees. And then just this last year, uh, some exciting news, the city has begun subscribing to a service to provide cell phone data through a company called Streetlight. Uh, information from cell phone towers track, um, track cell phones as they move from where they are at night, presumably residences, to wherever they are during the day. Uh, presumably at work. Um, VMT can, can, can be calculated based on the origin and destination and the routes taken. Uh, furthermore, this data can be segmented by census track and provides some rich demographic data uh, for the owners of those moving cell phones. Uh, we most re recently use that data for our East Arapaho subcommunity plan. Um, data can also track through traffic uh, which is another aspect of, of travel through Boulder. Uh, and for this year, Streetlight actually gave us their, their modified multimodal package uh, that can also segment out uh, other types of uh, vehicles such as uh, bicyclists and also pedestrians based on the speed of travel. So we are looking forward to using this new data set. A lot of the work that we did um, to come up with our, our GHG inventory analysis um, and, and 
uh, information that's in our TMP is from a kind of a 2014 2015 sweep analysis sweep is the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project. Uh, and we worked with them to project potential emission reductions based on the implementa implementation of Obama era cafe standards and looking at electric vehicle adoption rates. Uh, at the time of that analysis, um, the TMP goal was a 80% reduction uh, by 2050. So as you can tell, there's been many times where we've had both the targets change, uh, the target years change, and also the baseline years in which we're looking at. Um, the analysis also looked at projected emissions from BMT reductions from mode shift uh, by meeting our TMP objectives. The analysis separated out BMT and, and uh, greenhouse gas emission percentages for residents, non-resident employees, students, transit service, freight, and also personal aircraft from the Boulder Municipal Airport. Uh, the city plans on updating this analysis uh, as part of our TMP update and for future GHG inventories, uh, especially uh, excited about using our new cell phone data to do this. Uh, we certainly look forward to working with TAB um, on this effort, uh, given your expertise and your interest. Uh, one interesting note that we have already um, found out is that the actual vehicle adoption rate in Boulder is almost 25% higher than the assumed rates of the 2015 sweep analysis. Uh, okay, due to the investments the city has made in multimodal infrastructure, transit service, DDM programs, safety improvements for pedestrians and bicyclists, uh, the city has made progress in meeting BMT and mode share goals, although there is still much to do uh, to meet our goals and especially at a faster pace. The city has and will continue to work on installing charging infrastructure and, and fleet electrification. Uh, and as you know, the city recently added three fully electric hop vehicles vehicles, and we plan on electrifying more of the hot fleet over time. Uh, SOV trips by residents for all trips has steadily declined with a reduction of 44% from 44% in 1990 to 36% in 2018. And even more progress has been made on work trips by residents with a shift from 67% SOV travel uh, in 1990 to just 34% in the same uh, by our last one, which was in 2018. Uh, downtown Boulder with its parking management and TDM program featuring the master EcoPass contract uh, has seen less than half of employees using an SOV uh, to get to work prior to COVID. Uh, despite increases in both population and employment, VMT has declined from 2.62 million per day uh, in the climate action plan base year of 2005 to approximately 2.5 million today. Uh, if Boulder's daily VMT had grown at the same rate at the as the rest of the Dr. Cog region, our VMT would have doubled. Uh, while past actions have produced these results, we are still not on track to meet our TMT and GHG goals. Uh, fuel efficiency improvements and electrification will certainly contribute significantly to this effort, but we do need to continue our efforts to reduce VMT through mode shift. Uh, which is essentially what the TMP action plan intends to accomplish. Of course, we face a number of challenges. Uh, the ability to achieve these goals are also impacted by local and regional land use decisions, housing affordability, uh, desired economic and community vitality outcomes, and uh, most, almost most significantly, RTD's ability to provide the level of both local and regional transit service really needed to meet our goals. Um, in terms of future actions on fuel efficiency, I'm sure some of you have seen just last week, President Joe Biden signed an executive order aimed at making half of all new vehicles sold in, uh, in 2030 zero emission vehicles, uh, and will propose new vehicle emission rules uh, to cut pollution through 2026. Uh, Biden's proposed rules, which cover the, the years 2023 to 2026, are expected to be similar in overall vehicle emission reductions to California's 2019 deal with the automakers that aims to improve fuel economy 3.7% annually through 2026. For our own fleet, the city's fleet, uh, we, we have set policies around the purchase of vehicles requiring battery electric vehicles when available. 
uh, when not available, the, the next preferred option is plug-in electric hybrid vehicles. Of course, you uh, must know that um, there are some heavy duty specialized vehicles where there are no options currently available, uh, such as some of our fire equipment. Uh, recently, we, as I mentioned, we added our three hot vehicles. We are working presently on some new grant opportunities uh, that will add uh, possibly up to six new uh, hop electric buses in the near future. Uh, we're also uh, working with Excel on their transportation electrification plan, uh, which is centered on charging hubs, rebates for electrical vehicle purchases, and school bus electrification. In terms of the VMT sector, uh, we have many opportunities. Um, we look to Vision Zero to make it safer for our residents, employees, and visitors to walk and bike safely around our community. We look to shared micromobility, which will provide a key first and final mile option and make regional transit trips more viable with that first and final mile ability. Uh, and I think we also have a huge opportunity in telework, uh, which I've called uh, lately the silver lining of COVID. Um, for GHG reduction specifically, we need to focus on non-resident employees. Uh, the daily VMT of a non-resident employee for just one way of their work trip alone is almost double the re uh, a Boulder residence VMT for all trips. Um, and since 1990, we haven't really seen a change in their behavior other when gas prices spiked in 2008. Uh, we need to focus on regional transit, um, and we are working towards uh, BRT corridor projects on State Highway 119, State Route 7, uh, with CDOT and our regional partners. Uh, we also need to work with our re regional partners of Dr. Cog and the, more, and the North Front Range MPO to revamp our van pooling programs. And for those outside of RTD, and for those, um, especially those non-resident employees who are outside of RTD districts. Uh, and again, we need to keep working on maintaining the momentum of the telework shift, uh, which uh, can, can partially eliminate uh, work trips for a specific number of our non-resident employees. Um, as we initiate our next TMP update, uh, we look forward to working with TAB on overcoming these challenges and maximizing our opportunities uh, to meet our, both our TMP uh, and climate goals. And then my questions I have for you that were in the memo was, uh, does TAB uh, have any questions regarding uh, TMP and climate action plan goals, methodologies or analysis, any of our past achievements or future focus areas? I bet someone does. Mark, you had a question uh, when he was back on slide five, I think. Do you remember what that was? It was something about our rates of adoption of EV equals being higher. It, it, was, it was 25, it was a number, 25% of- That one, nope. Oh. No, it was, <laughs> it was farther forward. There you go, he was, nope. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, that one, okay. Yeah, it, there was, analysis. There was, yeah, there was a, you, you tossed oh. out a number that 25% uh, of something went somewhere Anyway, I, I tried to remember it and I've lost it. So if you if you see 25% of your notes for this slide, I had a question, but other than that, uh, we can go on. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what okay. you're referring to, but I can. I, I made a note that it, we were, you were back on slide five and I believe it was something along the lines of Boulder residents adopting e-vehicles 25% higher than was assumed. Oh, yeah. okay. Maybe it was a sweet, sweet oh. note. That's, yes, that's what yes. it was. Yes. There, Thank you. You're, you're welcome. welcome. <laughs> yeah. So, so basically, when Sweep did their analysis, um, I'll try and turn, turn on my camera because it's kind of awkward. <laughs> um, when Sweep did their analysis, they had an adoption rate for Boulder residents. Uh, and they predicted the number of electric vehicles that would be in Boulder by 2020. Uh, because that analysis was done in, really done in 2014. The report was 2015. Uh, and so we went back and looked at the number that they predicted for 2020. And then we looked at the number of electric vehicles that are actually in Boulder. And that number was 25% higher than SWEEP's projected estimate. Great. That, that answers my question. Thank you. 
You're welcome. So Mark, you did be smirched on the record several times, all these Tesla owners in town. Do you have anything to say to them now? Well, um, sure. Uh, they, there's, it's still a vehicle. That's right. <laughs> and, and I don't besmirch Tesla owners. I besmirch Prius owners like me, uh, plug-in Prius owners, Tesla owners. I don't care. Uh, I'll besmirch them all. It's still a vehicle. Uh, and we're still relying um, on Excel's uh, reduction in their, uh, in their coal and natural gas usage to produce the electricity to charge our vehicles. Again, self-inclusive here. Um, and, uh, and I think that sometimes uh, I'll besmirch us all and say we uh, are, are, are failing to do the hard work to change the things that are under our control, where what we can do within the city and whether it's vision zero improvements, uh, hardened facilities for cyclists to reduce VMT rather than rely on uh, the EPA and CARB and um, the electric vehicle market to make our job easy of reducing our greenhouse gas um, emissions. So I'll, I'll, I'm gonna turn that around and rather than besmirch anybody, I want to at the, uh, ask one question and that is, um, in our recent analyses, are we really doing all we can mm -hmm. or why aren't we doing more with what we can control? I, I'm not sure <laughs> how to answer that, Mark. Well, in terms of what? Okay, in turn, okay, total. Uh, if you look at our report card, uh, where we look at uh, total VMT um, uh, still trending out, uh, essentially it's not going down enough for us to reach our goals by 2030. Um, if you look at our greenhouse gas emissions, it's not going down enough to reach uh, our goals by 2030. And if you look at the progress we've made, much of that progress has to, to again, uh, to my uh, way of reading it, um, has to do with the grids reduction of use of fossil fuels and the electrification of vehicles versus actually getting people out of cars, onto bikes, onto trash, onto transit, walking, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so um, those things are harder, um, but we control those things. Uh, it's, not, it's not the market for electric vehicles. It's not federal subsidies, uh, tax subsidies for electric vehicles. It's not the next wind farm that Excel builds. It's, it's the things that we can control, we can implement, we can do. So, um, I'll make a case that we could be doing we could do be doing more under the things that we can control. No, and and I'd certainly agree with you. You know, when we look at <clears throat> GHG emissions, certainly uh, one of the big sectors is the non-resident employee. And since 1990, uh, the SOV mode share rate for the non-resident employee has pretty much been at 80%. Uh, only when the gas prices spiked, it did go up. So regional transit is certainly one of the key areas that we need to make significant progress on. To make, to provide regional travel options that are competitive to the personal vehicle in terms of time, in terms of cost, in terms of convenience. And I think that's what, you know, we're doing with the BRT projects on State Highway 119 and State Route 7. Those are the corridors that the majority of our non-resident employees enter and leave the city. And so that work to me is extremely important uh, in reducing uh, both VMT and greenhouse gas emissions, for example.
Jonathan, I see you've unmuted. Do you want to jump in here? <laughs> wow, you're very attentive. I appreciate that very much. Uh, yeah, good evening, everybody. My, my name is Jonathan Cohen. I'm the acting director of the Climate Initiatives Department. I also wanted to just introduce um, some of my team that's joined tonight. Uh, Carolyn Elam, who's the energy manager. She'll probably have a, a fair amount to, to add to this conversation. Lauren Trembley, our data analyst, um, who is fantastic with our numbers. And I'm not sure if I saw Matt Lehrman on, he had some parental duties this evening. He may or may not be here. Um, Mark, I, I, first of all, I'd really appreciate the opportunity to be with you all tonight. I, I hope that this is a series or a start of series of conversations um, with TAB. Um, and I have to just acknowledge the, the, the great work and the partnership that we have been building between our departments, between climate initiatives and transportation. And, and Mark, I also, I'm gonna start by saying I agree with you. Um, and traditionally, when we started our work going back to 2006, when we adopted our first climate action plan, all the way up to 2015, and then our revision, our last revision in 2017, up 2019, our focus has been predominantly on the biggest lever that we can pull related to emissions, and that has been in energy, and that has been in electricity generation. And when, when you talk about the things that we can control, I will say that much of our work up to this point has been in the policy realm, working at the state level, encouraging both the Public Utilities Commission and our regulatory agencies to apply pressure on our provider to clean up um, its energy supply, its electricity supply. Now we find ourselves in a very unique situation where we've been successful and we have a utility that has state mandates to reach 80% reduction in emissions uh, by 2030. That's good news. That allows us to shift our focus to more of the things, just as you say, that we can control. What, what are the next biggest levers that we need to be pulling? And that's why I think there is such a strong affinity between our departments and thinking about how we can really align around emissions associated with transportation. I think that's incredibly exciting. The things that we can control both in terms of policy, the things that we can influence in terms of community values. So um, I will just say, just going back to the besmirching point that was made. No, I'm, I'm just- I'm just... I, I, Tila got me off on this besmirching <laughs> thing. And I, I want to retract it. No, Mark, <laughs> I'm only kidding you. Anybody. I'm only kidding you. And, and Tila, you, you, I feel like you tricked me. Uh, don't, anyway, okay, so please, no, no, I, I appreciate the besmirching it. thing. I'm just ribbing you a little bit. Okay. I just wanted you to hear the point that I think this is really, um, a time to approach the climate issue with a greater sense of urgency. And it isn't about doing more of what we've done. It's really changing our approach and our tactics. And electrification is one of the tools that we use. Clearly, there has been such a, a history and a strong foundation for the work that has been coming out of the transportation department in terms of reducing BMT, um, looking at ways to get people out of their vehicles. And as a last resort, if they are going to be in a vehicle, making sure that it's electric and making sure that that electric vehicle is charged by clean, renewable electricity. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. I, I pre and, and Chris, I, I appreciate your, your replies to my castigating remarks. <laughs> sure thing. And, and there's many other tools as well in the toolbox. Yeah. Okay. All right. Can I, I want to give. Can I take a shot? Uh, yeah, Tila? go ahead. I saw. I saw you had unmuted. Hutch, go ahead. Yeah, I know some of these folks, so they probably know what I'm going to say before I say it. Uh, but I am particularly interested in how to handle the trade-offs across various, particularly business constituencies in the city around telecommuting. You know, there's folks that love it. I think many of us in the climate world sort of like it. But if you're the restaurant across the street from Google. Uh, that went there because, you know, they had 300 people in the building, you aren't so happy. Uh, and uh, we have a system where local merchants tend to have people's ears on the council level, at least. Uh, so I'm wondering how to really think about this and, uh, uh, you know, find ways for the city to encourage telecommuting. Yeah, no, I, I understand your point exactly. Uh, telecommuting, uh, especially during COVID, uh, we saw a 30% reduction in overall traffic volumes uh, in the city of Boulder. Significant uh, reduction. Um, we do know that telework is not for all types of jobs. You know, some jobs, as you mentioned, 
do not have the ability to have, have teleworking. There are, however, a lot of jobs in Boulder that, that do fit uh, that mold. Um, and I would say, you know, certainly one of the hard points is that trade-off, right? I mean, our city depends on sales tax revenue. Sales tax revenue, especially in our commercial areas, are very related to uh, re retail jobs, their restaurants, their entertainment, certainly need uh, people coming to those places, right? So uh, I think we have to really balance how do we both promote telework, but at the same time providing economic vitality for our businesses, which we rely on to generate sales tax, to do the work that we do. Uh, and it, it, it is a, I think it is a difficult balance. Um, certainly, I think one way we can, uh, we're, we're, we're already going to start working with businesses through Boulder Chamber and the BTC uh, to understand, one, how has um, teleworking transformed their businesses? Uh, we want to gather data on businesses that, you know, how are they going to continue? What's their COVID pivot for how they are um employing their workforce? Are they working from home? Is it partial? Is it a hybrid work environment like the city is working on? Uh, so we're going to start gathering that data and start listening to businesses. Uh, but I think we always, as you said, we have to be mindful of the trade-offs and the impacts of economic vitality when we don't have people uh, in Boulder during the day to, to spend money. It's, it's, a, it's an important question. Well, I think you, you, you captured it right, Chris. I mean, the reason I brought it up in that way is uh, I, I think that decision makers in the city are, go are going to be forced to make the decision systematically the wrong way because otherwise the city won't have its revenues. So you know, the, the link with the revenue model is, is going to kill the decision making on things like this uh, without some modifications to the revenue model. So yeah, uh, that's my concern. And I've had a couple of chats with the, some folks on the council about this that you know you, 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 you can't have a big right claw sort of driving your decision making, which is you know where you get the vast majority of your money <laughs> and then you know have the city change fundamentally. Uh, so, you know, yeah. I, I, do, well, I, do, I do think that, you know, the, the cross-departmental coordination, and maybe this comment in part to Erica, you and Jonathan, uh, need, needs to create the tangibility, be, tangibility about that to encourage council and others to say, okay, we really have to bite the bullet on these things about revenue models. If I may interject, um, I, I think that, you know, taking a thread from what um, whenever Nuria was speaking to Tab, um, you know, earlier this evening, she had indicated, you know, that she's very much interested in and committed to in looking across all the different plans and looking toward implementation and how, you know, they all kind of knit together and balance. And um, I, I think that, you know, Jonathan, I can speak for both of us. That's something that we're looking forward to because um, the discussion you're having tonight, you know, it's like kind of squeeze a balloon over here, it pops up someplace else. And so it's trying to um, come up with a different paradigm to make that actually solve for X and sort of that algebraic um, type of thing. Thanks. And, and if I may add just real hmm. quickly, um, you know, the city prior to COVID, we were working on some alternative funding mechanisms. Uh, for the transportation department. Uh, we certainly hope to renew uh, those activities um, you know, as soon as we can, because we, knew, we know that diversifying our revenue uh, is critical uh, to reaching some of those goals. And then those trade-offs won't be as, as difficult. They'll still be there, but maybe not as difficult. Well, I am left with a sense that we've kind of left one of the large levers on, on yanked when we've, when we've sort of allowed parking pricing discussion to get so watered down. You know, when you see that we saw a significant change in behavior when gas prices went up, I was like, yes, that's what, <laughs> that's exactly the kind of, you know, minute change that uh, can affect behavior. And we're not talking about all or nothing. We're talking about, you know, a, a constriction and a diminution of, um, you know, some a behavior that we've determined is somewhat harmful. <laughs> 
Um, and I'm quite curious about the, um, coming from California where I grew up, which is also car is king and mass transit is terrible in general with a few hot spots that are great. Um, carpooling became a real, uh, real lifesaver for very congested areas. And so to hear Chris, to hear you say like SOV, you know, hasn't budged since the nineties and therefore transit, uh, I, I feel like maybe you're, um, maybe you've done all the analysis and people won't carpool anyway, but, um, ride sharing, private ride sharing, you know, ad hoc kind of ways to encourage people to carpool really rescued a lot of the Bay area and, you know, couldn't like effective congestion pricing over the bridges and things. That's how they've managed. And it's horrible. Don't, don't get me wrong. We're not aiming for that. Um, but these seem like levers we could pull if we had um, sufficient um, drive. And I wonder if, if our, our poor direction is going to be that sufficient drive. I'm, I'm hoping it will ignite some appetite for re, readdressing and rethinking about some of these alternate funding models that, that you've mentioned. I wanna make sure I give Ryan a chance to Hop in here. He's gotten good job. There you have even put your hand up. <laughs> thanks, Sheila. Yeah. Um, Chris, thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. You have three questions. I, I, I have something for, for each of them. Um, just a couple of things first, though. Um, thank you also to John for being here. Um, and nobody's referenced it, so I'll do it. Uh, the, the big IPCC report was out today. Uh, telling us that we're, it looks like we're going to shoot past the 1.5 degrees. Not a huge surprise for those following us. But just to, I'd just like to ground us a little bit to point out that these discussions get really wonky quickly. But what we're talking about here is our, our biosphere collapsing and literally the seasons as we know them deconstructing. And um, as far as I'm concerned, this is the most important transportation issue and it's the more, most important um, city policy issue that we have to deal with. And um, I just think we should try to keep um, keep that as close to our minds as we can as we as we think about where we need to stretch, where we need to really need to push. And I know I've been a squeaky wheel on this, um, so I did want to channel somebody else. And we, it's a member of the public uh, that wrote in today. Uh, her name is Eileen Kerrigan, if I'm saying her name right. She wrote a, a pretty eloquent personal story about how climate change is impacting her, um, and she said. Essentially, like I, I take a thesis statement as electric vehicles and stricter cafe standards are necessary, but they're not sufficient to decarbonize transportation. And so two questions from her. How's the city reducing VMT and VMT per capita? And also, how do you how do you analytically think about um, the, the level of EV the adoption, the split between EV adoption and then um, all, everything else? And I didn't she didn't say it exactly that way, but um, these are similar questions that I've asked and I just wanted to recognize. Uh, we have members of the public um, asking us these questions. Um, and so um, the other thing just for um, before I go to the questions is um, in my day job, I work for an organization that's focused predominantly on EVs. And it's with an understanding of that and some of the limitations of EVs that I have come to much of this discussion and saying, well, what are we doing about mode shifting and, and BMT? So I, I really first want to just commend and thank Erica and Chris and the team for what appears to be having flipped the switch and getting getting BMT and mode shifting into, into this, um, which I'm, 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 I'm extremely grateful for and glad we don't have to um, keep talking about whether it belongs to me or not. Um, I, and specifically, I, I really appreciated Erica, the, um, or perhaps Chris, the, um, the, the, the language in the document uh, for today, which says that the TMP and its action plan serves as a framework for the, for the climate plan through transportation. Um, that's, that's great. That's what, we, that's what I've been hoping we would have. I hope this would have been here before. Would have been nice to have had it with our encounter at city council talking about, <laughs> about AMPS, um, but I'm really glad it's here. Uh, so I, I thank the, the team for moving in that direction. And um, I would just, uh, one more comment is, um, I'm, I'm glad that we have the common ground from this to build from. And I agree with Jonathan that we're gonna, um, I think there's a lot for us to sort of begin to unpack on this. And I, with that, and in the spirit of doing so, I just, I would quibble a little bit, Jonathan, with um, this. So there's this construct of, of things we can control um, and, and those are the things that we should spend a lot of our time on that I've, I've, you know, I've heard, heard you say a little bit about. I would say the thing that we can, as a city can control the most is the streets. It's, it's literally the streets that, we, that, that the city controls the direct operations for, all of the maintenance, all of the rules, all the enforcement. It is, and it is this team here. And I would say that if you, if you just consider where does the city have its levers to, to move climate um, or climate action, this is this is this is the 
the, this is the furnace room. This is, this is where we can actually move stuff. We have all the levers and dials and switches. Um, and so I, I just wanted, I, I guess I would suggest that we this, this be, uh, maybe just be, maybe better reflected in you know, as we think about where do we have the control. So um, anyway, thanks for the, pre the listening to the prelude. Um, on, on Chris, on the first question, uh, so your first question was, does the board have any questions regarding the TMP and its, and its climate goals? Um, I guess my first, my sort of main question is just, do you, do you, um, do we know what the big levers are for mode shifting, for VMT mode shifting? Um, and like, with like, I mean, I, I know the presentation you talked about a few kind of, kind of like thematic areas, but do we, do we have a, a pretty good understanding of the specific things that the city can do and, and will plan to do to, to actually drive the mode shifting? Um, and if so, what are those things? And if not, what do, what do we what do we need to do as a collective to to do to roll up our sleeves and really get our um, our, our hands as a team around this? Yeah, so I, I think there's you know there's many different things. Uh, we really have to provide viable options, multimodal options for people. Um, and as I said before, that is competitive to the car in terms of time, convenience, cost. Uh, that will get people to switch. Um, so as I already brought up the regional BRT example. Uh, surely that is gonna be a key, especially when we look at where our non-resident employees work. The other thing I think is one of the most underutilized modes, and it kind of points to something that Teal brought up was carpooling, but I think van pooling is, is one of those options uh, where, you know, you have places like Puget Sound that has like thousand plus van pools on the road. Um, you know, we, we have a few hundred. Um, and, you know, those programs are, are uh, Dr. Cog's programs and uh, the North Front Range MPO's program, the Van Gogh program. Um, the city for years has been providing uh, subsidies to anybody who uses a van pool. Uh, we also provide an additional subsidy for city employees to van pool as well. Uh, I think one of the key change we need to do in the van pooling is to simplify the pricing and the fare structure, uh, and also to provide uh, a benefit to our uh, to employees uh, where the employee pays a small portion and employers pay a larger portion. Uh, the University of Colorado implemented the, a van pool program where van pool riders pay a flat fee of $25 a month and CU picks up the rest of their van pool cost. Uh, typically a van pool cost is about $100 a month. Uh, so, the, so the employer is paying most of the cost of that. Um, I think that's a, a program we can replicate and Allison and I in our TDM program were on the verge of, of doing that before COVID hit. We will get back on that and do that. I think micromobility is a tremendous opportunity in our city. Uh, the first and final mile is a huge issue, especially for our regional transit users. Uh, you know, they get off the bus and they still got a mile to go. I think uh, the micromobility program, I think e-bikes in that shared program are going to be a huge game changer. Uh, we're going to continue invest in that, and and we're we're going to do the the year long pilot with the e scooters and and see how they work out as well. Uh, I think those are are two big things. Um, I'd mention again telework. Telework is a tremendous uh, um, way to just eliminate those work trips altogether, which have a, which are contributing a huge percentage of the VMT and the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, more closer to home. Uh, I agree with you on the streets. Um, to me, that is the essence of our low stress walk and bike network, uh, of vi our vision zero improvements of 15 minute neighborhoods. Uh, we need to do that. We need to make some bold land use uh, changes in order to really help those uh, happen. Uh, it's one thing to reduce uh, our speeds to our vision zero 20, it's quite another to look at, um, you know, some of our arterials and how we do those to really make the connection between the neighborhood and those commercial destinations that can be done safely by foot or by bike, um, you know, or by bus um, to make those daily trips taken. But, you know, we've done a, a good job with, with city residents. It's the non-resident employee is really some of the keys. Um, 
I, you know, I was really hopeful when the employee trip reduction program idea was circulating at the state uh, level. Um, unfortunately, that was kind of moved to be voluntary. Uh, but I think it it is a first step to something that will likely have a profound impact uh, on that employer side. Um, so, you know, those are some of the things off, off the top of my head that um, I think are the ways in which we can really start changing travel behavior and, and you know, the focus on that non-resident employee. And, and housing um, affordability, without a doubt, is, you know, is an issue. Um, creating more right. affordable housing here um, is, is another thing that I think would help uh, as well. Okay, thanks for that. I, great. So I, 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 I'm, in, I'm in violent agreement with uh, those topic areas. Look forward to hopefully figuring out a way we can help to, um, I guess, create a little more maybe discipline around them, maybe goals and discipline around those and tasks mm -hmm. and provide some support. Um, so, so thanks for that. Um, on the second question, do we have any questions on, on the past achievements? Um, I, I guess I, it was sort of, I don't, you know, I don't want to spend too much time here, but um, in, it, you, one thing that I think you presented in your slides and what I saw in the, um, the memo, the analysis section was that we've actually had some significant reductions um, from mode shifting um, from, from SOVs in, in the past. And I'm just curious if um, there's any th thinking on like what's the story there? Like what what did, did we did what what caused that? Did, did mm -hmm. something the city did that we can continue continue yeah. to build from? Yeah, I mean I, honestly, I would say you know um, the RTD EcoPass program, uh, which was essentially started in Boulder, uh, in our in our downtown, uh, the neighborhood programs, um, the master contracts, um, the CU College Pass. Um, when I have um, done the analysis of the survey results, we saw that someone with an eco pass in their pocket is five times more likely to use transit to get to work and leave their car at home. They are nine times more likely to use transit for a non-work trip. When I specifically, and, and this is getting, you know, the data is a little old, uh, but I did a survey of neighborhood EcoPass participants. I think this was maybe 2009. Um, I found out that people, residents with a neighborhood EcoPass produce 55% less greenhouse gas emissions than uh, a resident without access to one of those passes or, or a business EcoPass. Um, and so that brings me to, you know, a, an idea that we've certainly had for a long time in the city of Boulder uh, that we haven't been able to make it come to fruition, and that's the community-wide eco-pass. Um, and whether or not we do it within the parameters of RTD or we look outside of the parameters of RTD, I think that developing a way to subsidize transit passes uh, in some way or transit use in some way um, will make a profound difference. One of the more interesting things we also saw from that NicoPass study is that people with an EcoPass, not only do they take transit, you know, X amount more, they also walk and bike more. And I think that's really about the development of long-term culture change. The neighborhood EcoPass to me is fascinating because it creates a culture of transit use within a family. It is families using transit together. It is children learning to use the bus and the bus is normalized behavior. Uh, I would love to see that type of program expand. You know, we, we've tried within RTD, um, you know, and we may have to look for ways outside. And I know Mark, you know, we've been working together on that for a while. And, you know, I, I think we need to find a way to provide that transit subsidy uh, to more people. Great. Um, okay, so I have one more question on your second qu yeah, qu question of, do we have questions about past, past um, patterns? Um, so I, I look at the, the the current driving or the recent driving. I think it was 37 about 37 percent SOVs and about 21 percent um, multi um, multi multiple occupant driving. Um, and so you know that's in the 50 high 50s of, of cars driving around in the city. 
Um, and I'm, I'm just trying to imagine what's, what do we know about what's like, why are people driving? And one of my instincts is that, well, we have 30,000 ish students, school students. And so not, not university, but I mean like parents drive, you know, students going to elementary and, uh, and um, high school and so on. And my, my, feeling is that that's probably a big part of it and so there's this like the whole school system that there's some there's that's a, there's a big chunk of it but I'm just curious if you if, if that seems right or if there's any other stories about like what are the big reasons that people are driving if there's like kind of key categories or demographics that are really important to this you know understanding of what's happening in the city yeah uh, certainly I think we need to explore that more we do know that um, the majority of those multiple occupant vehicle trips are with children so driving children around is, is certainly, you know, a, a huge percentage of that. Um, you know, and I think when I when you look at school in general, uh, open enrollment has a significant impact um, on on travel behavior. Uh, and if parents have to, you know, start their day by taking a child to to school, they end up driving all the way to work. Uh, so that certainly has an impact. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll just go to the final one. And I've, I appreciate uh, folks' patience on this, just yeah. going through this um, methodically. Um, so you, the final question was, does the board have any input on focus areas for further GHG? Uh, I, I, do, <laughs> I do have input. Uh, if I could, I'll just um, verbally say um, the main things I think that, they, that could um, benefit from being added into here. Uh, and may, perhaps afterwards, I, I can write this down. Um, but I'll just, I'll just kind of go in order. So I think it's like maybe seven points here. So the, the first one is that um, one thing that jumps out at me is, is some of the references to things that the federal, the, the, the federal agencies are doing. And I would, I, I guess I would really prefer to have a climate, a climate action plan focused on the things that the city is acting on. Um, I, I think that's generally the, an accepted definition of the action of an action plan of an organization. Um, I, I know it's a little bit confusing to sort of unravel who's doing what. But you know, in general, I, I would think of CAFE standards and EVs that are being led, um, adoption being led from federal EV incentives. Um, that's not really climate action for the city. Um, what would be climate action for the city would be things that the city is doing to accelerate adoption of EVs. Could be charger incentives, charging infrastructure, TDM that encourages EV use or maybe carpool EV use, um, regulations that in, in, incur or some kind of incentives that encourage people to drive sm smaller vehicles. So I, I don't want to be too dogmatic about it, but I, I do think the, the plan would, would benefit from some discussion on, look, there's, there's sort of some background changes that are happening. Those are great. That's kind of baseline. And then what Boulder is going to focus on and report on are the things that Boulder is taking action for. Um, that's my first point. Second suggestion would be, um, I don't know if I missed it, but in the, in the, 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 the reference to including the TMP goals of, of vision, sorry, of um, VMT and mode shifting, I don't know if I saw Vision Zero, and I would just, I'd assert that, that Vision Zero should be on here as one of the key climate goals um, for the reason that we know the majority of people nationwide who don't bike, or sorry, we, uh, the majority of people who, a majority of people will say that they don't bike because they are legitimately afraid of being hit by a car. And there's more and more studies showing that the landscape is becoming even more hostile from the from the view of a of a bicyclist. And I don't mean Boulder specifically, but just just in general. Um, and so so there's a there's a strong connection between getting Vision Zero right and encouraging that mode shifting onto 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 bikes and pedestrians. So I I did, I did suggest that we ideally include that. Um, I think the third thing would be this is perhaps just going to take some time to work together on, but it's let, let's characterize the mode shifting strategies. And, the, um, and that means there are some things that were within our grasp, but there are some other things that are gonna require some work, but are still worth doing. Um, namely, some of these systems problems where you have to do you know, su supply and demand together um, and or areas where the city has said some of the obstacles are the city's own <laughs> departments and some of the you know, jur jurisdictional stuff um, itself. To me, those feel like things that um, re require some characterization in the climate plan of you know, how, how we're gonna attack those things. So what we don't end up doing is saying, well, we're not gonna pursue this one measure because it by itself is not gonna get us everywhere. Rather, here's the 10 things we need to do and, and the plans the, the plans for getting, getting to it. And in that, I would say parking, 
strategy to some extent is one of those small things that is necessary but not sufficient for, for this mode shifting. Um, so in any case, I just think we need some kind of a, a characterization of those, of those mode shifting strategies. Um, I, I think the, uh, just a couple more here. Um, you know what, I'll just cut to the last one. I, I'll write, I'll try to write this down um, and, and send it to, to the whole list um, and, and staff. But the final one I just, I thought I think is worth mentioning is, um, I feel like there's a role, I don't know if this goes in the climate plan exactly, but th there's a role here to play on educating um, different, um, different departments that are not transportation about the role of, of non-car options that can, that, can, that can help with economic and community vitality. And there's the one one topic is impact on local businesses. And there's you know there's an active discussion nationally taking place around the city around the country on on cities who are starting to understand that even though shop owners will say they, they just have this kind of life experience reflex to say well we need cars here to, to to grow the business, it actually turns out that putting more bikes in front of the business means more people coming in and, and there's and there's there's more um there's more economic activity and, and i think there's something around like just studying this a little better and, and really testing this idea that there's this strong tension between economic vitality and, and some of these mode shifting goals because i because i think what we're finding is there's 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 a lot more complementarity than a lot of people expect um and then and then the other part of economic community vitality is just you know what one of the one of the big opportunities of giving people alternatives to driving in a car by themselves is that we're putting wealth back back into people's pockets and um the, the more that we can help people to accomplish that the, the more that we're, we're increasing the economic and community vitality um you know big big picture so um i would love for the the plan to include some some reference to those topics um so in any case i, I thank you for uh listening and i'll just um i'll i'll, I'll get off the podium here and um I'll, I'll aim to write some of these down and submit yeah no, I, I look forward to working, you know, with you. And as we do our update, um, our next GHD inventory, and, you know, we're going to be embarking on the transportation master plan, you know, really look forward to working with you to incorporate those ideas. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Ryan. Um, Chris, I had emailed you over the weekend. I had a question about whether we're considering freight traffic or... Yes. So that's part of the numbers or not part yeah. of it. Yeah, certainly is. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, I, I can provide you uh, additional information on the breakdown. Again, okay, I'm curious. You know, it's an older it was difficult study. for me to discern that from the materials. Okay. Yep. Thanks. Uh, anyone else? Oh, Alex perked up and unmuted. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Ryan for initiating this conversation, I think, and all the work that staff put into this. And I'm glad to hear that this might be a little bit more of a series than a one-off meeting. Earlier, early on, I was a little disconcerned hearing, I think Nuria mentioned that the county holds the strongest levers and then within transportation, the RTD is who we're, we're most dependent on to solve some of those regional um, issues. But Chris, in response to some of Ryan's questions, named a, a ton of things that are, are within the city's control. And some of those will take time, some of those will take money, some of them will take um, drawn out processes. But what I haven't heard is anything that perhaps could be rather immediate, something that we could put before a council and say, do we have the political will? Will you stand behind us to take bold immediate action? It feels like we've declared emergency uh, but aren't acting with much swiftness. So I agree with everything, Chris, that you said. Are there any of those that you think are particularly quick things we could do? Or with our streets being the essence of our low stress walk and bike network and perhaps the thing that the city can really control, are there mm -hmm. things within the streets that we could do in a, in a brisk manner with enough public and uh, political support? Well, I know, uh, you know, new development is not a huge, you know, part of this equation. Uh, but, you know, prior, you know, we were working on the parking code changes and also a potential TDM ordinance uh, for uh, new development. So I think those are things, you know, the parking code changes really should take a, a short amount of time. Um, you know, we, we certainly want to look at also, you know, the development of smart streets, 
and making sure that we have uh, electric, electric vehicle charging infrastructure in place. I think those will also make a big difference. Um, you know, I, I think there are also possibly, you know, um, some policies, you know, kind of that TDM dial of, of doing policies around uh, TDM requirements requirements for existing businesses as well, not just uh, new developments. Uh, that has not gained a lot of traction in the past, but um, you know, policy changes uh, can happen and have a much faster, quicker impact. Okay, I think including some of those as in, in some of these materials would be helpful and almost present it as a, a menu to a mm -hmm the current or upcoming council would be perhaps ways that we could expedite some of these efforts. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Anyone else? I think we've done our round robin. I too am encouraged that um, to hear that this was hopefully the beginning of a, a few iterations of this conversation. So look forward to continuing it at some point down the road soon with you, but thank you very much for coming. Thank you, and, and thank you Thanks. to my climate Thanks, initiative Jonathan. colleagues yeah. for, for joining us right. uh, on this Monday night. Lauren, thank you, yeah. Hey, Gila. Oh, Mark, yes. Uh -huh. I, I, I just have one final little comment, and that was, um, uh, Ryan, I, I, I wish you could have been on the East Boulder uh, sub-community plan joint meeting with the planning board, because, and I was, I was scrambling, trying to find the uh, the latest version of the East Boulder subcommunity plan. But the striking thing, just in terms of this topic, was that that East Boulder subcommunity plan mentions climate in, in the most general of ways and doesn't really doesn't relate uh, housing, tr travel distance from home to employment. Uh, it, it really doesn't relate in any quantifiable, measurable, or even, even beyond just a, a, a basic sentence or two in the outline or goals, there's nothing, there's really nothing there. And I think that as we, as a city go forward, the um, <clears throat> Jonathan's team needs to be involved in, in every, you know, the, this cross collateralization of departments and de-siloing of things but every plan that we produce has to be viewed with, at least with a climate lens, if not entirely through a climate lens. And, um, and that, you know, that anyway, the East Boulder subcommunity plan was one that was um, a, an excellent example of a plan that had been worked on for a very long time in the very recent past uh, that just really climate was not uh, addressed in any meaningful way. So I'm hoping we can we can work on other plans. And Mark, to just to draw it out, I, I think this is this is totally solvable with with a a climate plan here in which we say, okay, let's just let's say mode shifting is half. I don't know half of it for transportation. And then within mode shifting, we've got four key strategies. They're each going to you know do a quarter of the work. And then that gives that gives the um, the direction to other departments to say, well, okay, this this is the strategy that we're not feeding into. I'm just making up the numbers and the fractions, but um, yeah. So hopefully we can get to that get to that point. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. Yes, last words, twenty seconds. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'll do, I'll do it quickly. I just wanted again appreciate all of the comments. Really, really positive, and I I want you all to know that I think this is exactly what Eric and I have been talking about. How do we think about climate? less of an appendage, something to kind of tack on to the end and making it deeply rooted in our in our planning process. So how we are starting to work with our colleagues in planning to think about how land use plays into a very broad and comprehensive climate strategy, how this is really a lens that we begin with and not end with. So I just wanted to, again, appreciate all the comments that I've heard tonight and again, reiterate that this is a beginning of a, a number of conversations that we should be having on this topic. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for being here tonight. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you, Tad. All right. We're going to close this out now uh, and we will move to matters. Uh, first up for matters uh, non agenda safe streets report update from Devin. Dila, I will yield my time here unless Tab feels 
that my presentation did not give a sufficient update on the Safe Streets report. I see no objection from any member of TAP. Thanks for being so thorough before. You're <laughs> um, And then I remember my notes. So that draft is going to council in December. So we'll expect to see it. Yeah. Correct. And then next, shared micromobility program. Hi, DK. Hello, Tila. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Tab. Nice to see everyone. And I can't think of a better uh, timing than to give you some of the news that I have for you tonight regarding our shared micromobility program. I've got a brief uh, presentation that I'm gonna share with you here. <clears throat> so it'll let me. It's working. Great. Now let me just move to um, presentation mode here. Second. Maybe Chris Hagelin's kids are playing on your network now, hogging <laughs> all your bandwidth. Yes. It seems to be loading. Okay. There you go. Slideshow from beginning. All right, here we go. There we go. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot, everyone. I have a, uh, just a quick um, presentation to give you some exciting news. Again, I think the timing is perfect to release this news. You guys are the first to hear it. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is all about um, our micromobility, our shared micromobility program. And we've come to the point where we have uh, selected um, our vendors and we're ready to share that information with you and cover some of the highlights. But uh, quickly, just to give you an overall understanding of the whole selection process, um, in August, 2020, we issued an RFI request for information, which provide us a lot of background information of what we can expect. So between uh, September, 2020 and February, 21, February 2021, uh, we had a collaborative process that we did uh, with some community stakeholders to develop a shared scope of work. What did we want to see in that program? And so those entities were CU Boulder, Boulder County, TAB, thank you very much, Hutch and Tila, for contributing your time to helping to help shape that RFP. Um, the Boulder Chamber, Community Cycles, Shared Paths Boulder, and Boulder Housing Partners, to name a few. And so this really is, a, I think, a shared uh, or a shared vision in terms of what we want to get from our shared micromobility program. And so all that work went into um, to develop an RFP, which we issued in March of 2021. Um, and then from April through May, um, the response team, um, I'm sorry, the review, the response review team, which consisted of the city, staffers, CU Boulder and Boulder County um, participated in several interviews and demonstrations. And then in May, we selected the vendor, vendors. And then we had um, the contractual process, which lasted a few months, and we just completed that. And so here we are today to announce the, the vendors and share um, the details for the program commencement. And so um, our two lucky contestants are B-Cycle um, and Lime. And so uh, with B-Cycle, there's a very important caveat, or I should say nuance to this. Uh, B-Cycle LLC, the subsidiary to Trek, which manufactures all the B-Cycle components, came to the table with a response to our RFP to take over operations of our current B-Cycle system. Uh, this was very helpful in terms of having a private firm behind or a corporation behind uh, running the program in terms of um, our annual subsidy that we will no longer have. They partnered with Lime e-scooters uh, to develop sort of a co-proposal and they've been working um, closely uh, back and forth to develop the kind of what will be our shared micromobility program consisting of e-bikes and e-scooters. So a few highlights um, for each, um, the, the e-bikes and the e-scooters. Uh, they're working on a transition to fully electric uh, assist fleet. They, we won't have any more pedal bikes per se, uh, human powered pedal bikes. They will all be uh, electric assist bikes. Uh, we'll have 400 e-bikes in circulation in 2021 and we'll gradually increase that number in 2022 up to 500 as we expand the service area to all parts of Boulder, including, um, including Gun Barrel. And uh, one of the things that they'll be working on is to refurbish the existing docking stations. 
there's a new brand, or I should say an updated brand for B-Cycle, this black and white logo up there. And, and so you're gonna see changes coming to the existing stations. And there are also gonna be these new 3.0 modular docking stations that are a little bit more versatile and we can install those um, in, in many more locations throughout the city. And they don't require the same amount of infrastructure. Um, the previous stations were, were pretty expensive to uh, manufacture and also install. Um, and so these modular docking stations are battery powered and they, um, they're, they're a lot more, like I said, versatile and can be stuck in nooks and crannies and whatnot. And again, the expanded service area is what we're really excited about having service in North North Boulder, um, East Boulder, South Boulder, um, those places where we don't have e-bikes service today. And all these will be linked with transit. That's a big part of this and, and really helping to drive down those regional transit or those regional um, vehicle miles. And then Lime, um, some details for Lime e-scooters, uh, will be getting their new S4 model. And, uh, and we had an opportunity to demo uh, these particular devices. They, um, they're new and they have, uh, they're a little bit more sturdy than um, some of the earlier versions of e-scooters. Larger uh, wheel diameter, um, a more solid frame, uh, swappable batteries. Um, those will come in time. Right now they're still using the batteries where they're installed within the scooter. Um, but just, a, a, you know, the latest and the greatest when it comes to the technology. Um, and so, you know, it, it, there's, we've been somewhat beneficial in terms of waiting um, because now we're getting the, I guess, the cream of the crop now in terms of uh, technology, a little more sustainable as well. These will also last a lot longer in the field. So at the start, we're going to see 200 e-scooters. Um, these are capped at 15 miles per hour. And uh, Lime may um, increase the number of scooters in the fleet through a demand-based cap model. So um, if these devices are getting more than two rides per device per day, uh, we can expand um, their uh, fleet size um, by 20% every two weeks. And then, uh, so we're, this first year of operations, we are looking at um, limited service in East Boulder uh, for the first year of operations. And of course, we'll do an evaluation, quarterly evaluation, keep you guys up to, up to speed on, on what's happening, what developments are occurring, and, and how things are going. Um, but after that first year, we'll, um, we'll, we'll do a formal evaluation um, report, and then we'll bring it back to TAB and City Council with recommendations on how to um, move the program forward. One of the interesting, or uh, I guess, uh, yeah, one of the interesting program, or the uh, pieces of this program with the scooters as uh, for the first ride, there's a training um, ride mode where the scooters can only go eight to 10 miles per hour. And so from, from a lot of the data that we did looking at crashes, 30% uh, of the crashes um, were occurring for first time riders. And so we really hope this is going to help um, with safety um, out the gates. In terms of communications, uh, we have a joint press release going out August 11th. That's just in a couple of days. That's with CU, uh, Boulder County, um, and Boulder Chamber, Lime, and B Cycle. Uh, we'll have the, the uh, we'll announce the vendors and also the program details. Um, our city webpage is going to be a great resource here. We'll have FAQs um, talking about how to um, how to check out one of these bikes or scooters, where they can be ridden. Um, safety, helmet use, parking appropriately, responsible parking, um, access to affordability programs, how to report issues, and of course, contact information. We'll also be using a number of other um, tactics from our communications team, a city newsletter, inside Boulder news segment, social media, collaborating with our community partners on those, and then um, uh, blog posts, and then a, a big piece of this too, and again, for those regional trips, is that communication with local businesses utilizing the, the strength of the chamber and BTC. And that's really um, what I had for you here tonight. Um, hope that was brief enough and gave you the, um, the good information and it's exciting to be here at this point and we're ready to launch this program. So with that, I can answer any questions if you'd like. Thanks DK. When Thank do they you. hit the ground? So the scooters are going to hit um, August 17th. Yeah. And how does this affect um, CU's um, planning? So CU um, is also in the process um, of- They're doing a separate RFP process, right? 
No, no, not a separate RFP process, but a separate oh. agreement. Yep, so they're finalizing their agreements right now as well. So everything is uh, timing up pretty nicely here. Okay. Uh, yeah, for both CU um, and the city and all of our stakeholders. So um, exciting to be at this point and we're ready to launch this program. Good. Mark, go ahead. Um, so has CU changed well, well, what is CU status in terms uh, in terms of scooters on campus? Is that at last I heard or understood, it was no. But what 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 is CU's policy on scooters? Thanks for asking that question, Mark. Um, they've had they've had a change um, in mind, um, and so they uh, are still concerned about e-scooter use on their main campus. But for the first year of operations, they're willing to give it a go. And the e-scooters will be allowed on East Campus and also at Williams Village. So parking those devices and use of those devices. There'll be specific dismount zones, um, but they are uh, they're willing to give it a try, um, as we all are. And so um, working with them very closely <laughs> to develop a successful program, we, we hope it will be. And I, I see the uh, dismount symbol down in the in the bottom of uh, I'm pointing to my screen and you can't see that. But anyway, on the on the current slide, I see the little dismount symbol. Have we um, finished, started? What's the progress on our two consolidated uh, dismount zones in the city and signage and uh, community education on those dismount zones? All right, the Boulder Revised Code um, has been changed. Um, the maps are linkable from the um, Boulder Revised Code webpage. All the markings now are in place in both the University Hill and, in, and also in the downtown area. Um, and education is ongoing. We've been doing, this is a, um, I purposely put this little image in here. It's one of our communication assets to help folks know where to, you know, these devices can be ridden. So this communication outreach will be ongoing, but we've initiated it um, when that policy was changed. Great, thank you. Any other questions for DK? Just scroll through here. Great, thanks a lot for your time. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Oh, and DK, this is, uh, you must feel pretty good to actually have this coming about finally, huh? Oh yeah, absolutely, Mark. Thanks for, for yeah, most definitely. It's been, it's been a real team effort, um, you know, multi-departments within the city, I mean, uh, every community stakeholder you can think of within Boulder. Um, it's really a collective vision coming together and it's go time. So it's, uh, we're, we're happy to be here and, and to see this thing through. Well, good work, thank you. Thank you kindly, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, what's next? Heads up about asphalt and paint challenges for projects, Erica. Um, so just wanted to quickly share with you that um, we're running into some challenges in terms of getting projects out um, into the field. And the reason why is that there is a statewide um, shortage of asphalt. And that's um, due to a number of different factors. One is that the largest supplier binder um, material had shut down their operation for maintenance and they're having it's taking a little bit longer um, due to get things up because of um, international supply chain issues um, there's also a shortage of truck drivers to deliver the um, binder to us as well as a shortage um, of folks to actually um, you know to fill fill in and um, the contractors that we use you know to do that so just wanted to make you aware of it that you know we had lots of goals and aspirations to be able to do things very quickly and agilely this summer but we're running into some issues so just wanted to give you that heads up around that and we're keeping a very close eye on it hmm. okay um, so you know that's Full information sharing. The other thing too is that um, we have been getting many inquiries about, oh, the US 36 bridge um, is falling at um, baseline. In fact, it's not. And just wanted to make sure that um, you know you are aware of that. Uh, we have been talking with you know about repairs for CDOT, and we're expecting those to you know happen um, you know 
a little bit later on in the fall. But what you'll see is that you know there's um, some delaminating of the um, of the concrete and some exposed rebar and everything. There are no safety concerns, but um, there's a bit of alarm that's been going up among some folks. So just want to make sure that you're you and the viewing public are aware that there are no safety concerns and that the repairs are on the way. And that's thanks. Right. Hadn't heard of that. Is it mostly visible to people on the on like under underneath and on the ground or to drivers? Um, so it's visible to people that are going underneath it. So whether or not you're yeah. biking, walking, or driving. Um, depends on how observant you are. But okay. <laughs> now that each of you are observant and um, people talk to you, just wanted to make sure that you were aware that there were no safety. Thank you. Okay. All right. Is that it for matters from staff? It is. I think so. All right. We'll move on to matters from the board. Uh, there's any debriefing that we should be doing from the joint planning board and tab working session. Um, Mark had tried to spur some interest in having a, you know, more formal comments to city council since there were some developments like right as that meeting was beginning. Is that, am I remembering these things right? Um, I was a little addled because the, the news of uh, Mr. Acosta came in while we were on that, that meeting. So I think a bunch of us were maybe not attending perfectly. <laughs> to matters. Um, I did find, as I had mentioned at the end of that meeting, that it was pretty interesting to see our very different perspectives that, that to some extent it felt like there had been ships passing in the night with respect to thinking about transportation planning and, and concept plans and, uh, and staff and members of the planning board. They just didn't have the same kinds of perspectives that we did. So I was really pleased that we had a joint session. Um, any other perspectives, any input? Mark, you're unmuted. None, none other than what I said earlier, where um, there was lots of discussion about jobs, lots of discussion about housing, uh, and very little about how either of those two things relate to climate change and greenhouse gas reduction, and how uh, in, in the East Boulder subcommunity plan, uh, you know, the idea of, of of having people live near where they work, gee, that means several things, but especially uh, fewer in commuters, uh, mm -hmm. fewer less commuting overall, and, um, and some great benefits to, to the community. And so, it, it, yes, it was interesting, Tila, the distinction uh, between uh, a majority of the planning board members and and tab and and even with our trying to focus on transportation, um, it, there there was definitely a, a a lack of of in my mind of acknowledgement of the relationship of the plan to uh, reach our climate goals and how mm -hmm. how how that how those things should mesh together. That was it. Thanks. Anyone else? All right, Ryan, we missed you. Um, GAC update. How did it go? Did you empty the pockets of OSMP? You know, it was, um, uh, we had a different representative from uh, OSBT on oh, OSBT the GAC day. this year. And so the, uh, the temperature was lower and the meeting was more productive, but I, I, I attribute that much more to the meeting was led this year uh, by um, Joe Tadeucci of the utilities department, huh. who um, es essentially last year, there was a great fear that these, these great assets were being kind of set adrift without uh, leadership or management, and um, and Joe has stepped in, and he he was very careful to not just accept responsibility for the uh, the greenways, but he acknowledged that a lack of uh, directorship or management, and this is in no way 
to um, diminish all the people that work on the greenways. They, they just tend to do it as best they can without, I think, uh, good, concise guidance or, or leadership. Joe addressed that in the meeting. He came to the meeting prepared and, um, and it put, I think it put the uh, Greenways Advisory Committee members at ease that, oh, we have, we have someone here because we were, we were kind of on our own with some administrative staff help last year, but the, the lack of uh, high level directorship was really apparent last year and this year that was addressed. And there was the main product of it was discussion that we should meet more than once a year to approve a CIP that uh, we looked at the day before and that these are important assets and that, and, and in fact, everyone agreed that we should meet more than once a year. So, so whoever's gonna be the, oh. I, I was I just gonna say, I think you just volunteered to do it. <laughs> yeah, oh, no. I, Alex gets to do all the, all the, all the <laughs> they're going to meet every other week now for six months. Alex. You're welcome. <laughs> I see the value in uh, looking at the CIP a few times before you vote. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> all right, good. Um, we are now at open board comment. Anyone have any burning issues? Ryan. Um. So I'm not sure where this goes, but um, I, I'll just try it here. I, uh, I was having a, um, I'm tooling around lately on my, our, our cargo bike with small kids looking for places to park and, you know, sort of finding continuously trying to find a good bike rack. And it's, you know, I was in Evan G uh, fine park and so this ramp, sort of this going up the ramp with the, the upside down triangle lines and it, it really didn't work for the bike. And, I uh, was just sort of asking some folks like, hey, what's the story here? Like, how do we, who's in charge of the bike racks? How do we get, um, you know, more standard um, uh, two, spec, two spec bike racks that, that cyclists, you know, there's, a, there's kind of a framework for the bike racks to work well for actual cyclists. And um, I think Sue, Sue Pram from Community Cycles mentioned, oh yeah, you know, we actually given advice to the city on this, you know, a while ago. Um, there was a big purchase that sort of landed with a bunch of, a bunch of these ones. Um, but we haven't, this has kind of been a cold, a cold issue for some time. So I, I, I don't know where things stand on this, but I just um, wanted to make sure that if, if there's any big purchases or, or ways we can um, influence good, good bike rack, good practice of bike rack, both, lo, you know, loca the location of the bike racks, the design of the bike racks, the insulation of the bike racks, and in a way that are, um, are reflect modern bikes including cargo bikes, electric bikes, and our desire to have more bikes. Um, would love for us to have a chance to weigh in on that. So maybe this is a future board meeting comment, but I just, you know, on, on the, on the, sorry, one more topic or thought here is, is on the climate plan with the idea that we're going to, we're going to create more bikes when, to replace cars. Part of that is the low stress network. No, no question about that. But another part is creating a more frictionless travel experience for people to have a sense that when they get to the place they're going, they're going to have a good place, a good location, an easy way to, to you know, park the bike, if they have kids or whatever, and then and move on. So this is, it's not a small thing. I think that somebody who, you know, doesn't spend a lot of time on a bike, it's sort of like, oh, what are you complaining about? But this is really one of those, you know, one of a, a few things that's actually doing quite a difference. So um I guess I'll just register my comment that I think this is important. And if there's any, you know, chance for us to help staff to, or the, yeah, staff to get, get this right, we'd love, love to weigh in on that. So I'm, I'm not sure where your, which bike racks they were, because I feel like the ones right by the playground, there are the U, U racks. Um, so I'm not sure where the triangle ones are. Um, right, but there the, is, just, just and east, I couldn't. Just east of the play, oh, oops, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just east of the playground, oh. I've never had problem. I'm, I got a. I don't have a cargo bike, but I have a big trailer. Uh, but there is, and I couldn't point you to where, but there are like engineering standards for placement of bike racks for the city, and those were what Community Cycles referred to when they were supposed to be installing them for businesses. But there are clearances, there are spacing requirements. It's supposed to be on a concrete pad. It's supposed to be these inverted U's. That engineering standard does exist somewhere in the City of Boulder guidance. 
Um, it's not mandatory for private businesses. And I don't know what the process is for getting different ones in the parks, but I, the, what you're describing, I think does exist somewhere. So what I was gonna say um, just br very briefly is that you'll have an excellent opportunity to weigh in on that um, with the design guidelines. And so, you know, that could With the DCS time. update. Right. Yeah. I just want to. Is that? Go ahead, Mark. I was just going to concur with you, Ryan, and, and just add the one thing that I've had to experience as a um, cargo bike, e bike rider, is I have to be very careful that I do not block. Uh, disabled access. There, there is there. I think there is a brewing conflict between large bike parking uh, and and handicap ramp access and stuff. That um, as bikes are bigger, longer, heavier trailers. Uh, that and, and I think cyclists many times are are not cognizant um, of of how they might be impeding. Uh, disabled access to stores, parks, et cetera. Mark, that is exactly right. And on first blush, somebody might look at it and say, well, what, what are these big, why, why do we want these big, big bikes around? But if we go back to what Chris told us, which is 20 some percent of our, of, or half of the, or I forgot what the number is, but some large share of these multi-occupant vehicles driving around town, our parents moving kids, this is the vehicle to replace those kids moving a few miles. Um, and I will be one of those parents driving across the city in my bike starting next week for a kindergartner. My plan is to take every single one of those trips in a bike. Um, we'll see how it goes. I'll report back. But, but you know, th this, is, this is the kind of, kind of thing we should be really trying to encourage. And so if the design um, uh, construction standards is the right place to do it, I, that's great. But I, did, I do my, my sort of thinking of this from a manager standpoint, I just wanted to check that that's right because you know, there's a manner manner of what are the standards, but there's also the manner of who's doing the procurement, and then there's who's actually doing you know the implementation. So, if, if that's right, if that's the place to focus, let's do it. But it just strikes me that this feels like an issue that might get kind of lost in the actual implementation of it. Ek, do you have something to add? If it's okay, if I if I could, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think Erica was um, was on the right vein there that it's a DCS item. Um, there is a bike parking um, policy. There is an ordinance in place in the Boulder Revised Code for how and where and what type of bike racks are installed within the city. Um, there are different entities that manage bike parking um, with say in the downtown or in the parks and whatnot. And so um, I'm happy to, if, uh, to follow up with you, Ryan, to, um, if needed to, to talk with you more about uh, what's in place now and, and some of those procurement questions you have and how we go about requesting uh, bike racks for parks and, and whatnot. So this is a uh, one of my duties as a bicycle planner. So I'm, I'm happy to to help in, in any way possible. Thank you, DK. And before you before you mute yourself, okay. What's what what happened and what's the plan with the bike counter that got crumpled on 13th Street? Yeah, that's really unfortunate. That was a yeah eco, called the eco totem, and it visibly displayed you know how many um, cyclists were traveling through that particular intersection um, it's uh, not repairable it was demolished um, as you probably saw pictures of that uh, through social media and so we're waiting now to um, to see if their the, the, the cars or the driver's insurance will cover the replacement we're also you know putting into question is that the, the best place to in, to have that particular kind of counter there because it's been hit multiple times and so <laughs> right what's the right kind of counter? You know, it's a great location for a counter, but what's the right type of counter to put in that location to continue counting bikes? And if we have to do a replacement with the eco totem, is there another location um, that might be more suitable? Okay. All right, we're still collecting data in the meantime though, right? Because the, the tracks in the road are still there. Is that right? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know if the, so there is an electromagnetic loop that counts, the, you know, the, the cyclists and feeds over to this little box that's, you know, underground and, and whatnot. I, I'm not sure if, um, if when that was demolished, if, if it affected the numbers. Um, I'll have to follow up with you on that one, Tila. Okay. If, you know, lost any data or not. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That, was, that was my burning issue. <laughs> About a year month. ago. Happy August. Think, Go ahead, Alex. 
about a year ago, I think a drunk driver took out the Whittier South sign on Walnut at 18th Street. And after it sat there for a couple of months and eventually we, uh, the city crews removed it. Is there, is that something that gets replaced or is that just a relic lost to traffic violence? I will need to follow up with you on that because I remember asking Bill Cowron that very self same question and he said he'd get back to me and I don't remember what the answer is. So I'll replicate that. All right, thank you. Anybody else for open board comment? Great, future agenda items. Um, so of course you saw at the end of Devin's uh, presentation, there were some highlights of future agenda stuff. Um, two that I wanted to raise were already raised in different contexts this evening. And then just following up on something I had mentioned last month um, was that uh, Erica, Natalie and I have been continuing to refine and work on the uh, like draft rules of procedure for a tab. Um, I have missed my own deadline of last week. So <laughs> I owe them a little bit more work product, but it is nearly, nearly done. Uh, we just wanted to make sure that we uh, let the city attorney's office um, have a look at it before disseminating it. So my, my plan is to stop procrastinating, get that done uh, in the next couple of days, have it to the city attorney in plenty of time to circulate to you guys to, um, to look at, to read, and we will discuss it next month. If I may, Tila, just to say, yes. you're, you're overly harsh on yourself. You're a great oh, no. working. I'm a real there. procrastinator. <laughs> and um, we greatly have appreciated the ability to work you know, together on that. So thank you. Okay. That's nice of you, thank you. <laughs> I did miss my own deadline, it's okay. Anything else for future agenda items? Yes, Ryan. To a couple things, um, just, just kind of retracing what we talked about today. So I, it sounds like climate there. I, I don't know that we made a, a, an actual next steps plan, but it, but it sounds like we're going to need to come back to this to some level mm -hmm. on the, the climate plan on the next level of, of development. Right. I guess maybe that goes to staff to advise us. Um, I'm happy to make myself available for offline or, you know, smaller group if needed. Um, so that's one. Another one is, I don't think we, I don't know if we raised this specifically, but um, I would just say like, I, I hope we can make as a procedural matter, if, if there's unfortunately another fatality or um, serious injury, we have another way to kind of do what we did today. Forgive me if we've done this before and that's, that's all implied, but um, I, I just, I think this was the right, the right thing to do. Um, and then the third thing is um, in, on back on a discussion that, you know, Chris, I think Chris acknowledged a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the in driving within the city is, is schools, is school, school traffic, parents driving their kids around. School starts next week. Um, I, as a parent with kids going, starting kindergarten, I haven't really heard much on what school, like the, the TDM plan for schools. Um, would love, love to make sure that the parents are doing their most. So, um, or the schools are doing their most to help parents make that all work. Um, the trip tracker thing, I tried to register with that. That's not really up yet. So I know the schools are busy. I don't want to be too hard on the schools, but it does seem like at some, at some level, this is a pretty big center of activity for our, our traffic and travel. And um, at some point, would love to follow up again with the schools. And I know I, I called for this, a school item a few months back, so I, I don't want to be overbearing, but um, it just seems like there's, there's really something there with, with, um, with, with schools that we should be following up on and making sure all the parents are getting the best advice how do you how do you ride your bike if you can carpool, cargo bike, and all that stuff? So, so BBSD did send an email a couple of days ago that got buried in my my stuff, and I went back and looked carefully at it. They looking specifically for some of that stuff. They have some links to a new program about like setting up your own carpooling, vanpooling kind of system. Um, and I think that a lot of it is that there has been some changeover with some of the BBSD um, personnel working on this stuff, and so there's going to be a bit of a learning curve this fall. Um, but they have already started sending out some messaging. Um, so go back and review that and I think stay tuned. Um, yeah, because Peter Hurst is no longer doing the trip tracker. So I'm not surprised it's a little slow to get started. And we don't know, we won't know until tomorrow night, right? What, <laughs> whether masks are happening or distance, like there's just so much up in the air right now. Um, they're starting to offer parents who are using buses to get to do their own travel and get reimbursed by the mile. I have a few thoughts on that. Um, 
So I think COVID's not doing any any favors to that team, but you're you're right to be thinking about it and right to be not trying to step on toes at the moment. Um, but I think you and I are going to be the ones really paying attention to this stuff and bugging them. So thanks for that. Um, well put, but we will not take any immediate action on that one. How's that? <laughs> okay. Mark. So I'm going to, um, I, I'm feeling repetitive here on my future agenda topic items, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, and I have three I'd like to, and I, I would also like the board, if it's like Mark, you know, we're not going to do that. Just like, let's just say that. Um, anyway, the um, Clay Fong uh, presentation on Boulder's history, I think TAB could benefit from that. And I would like to see that on a, uh, a future TAB agenda. That's one. Um, and I don't know if any progress or anything has been done. If, if someone wants to task me with contacting Clay uh, for a future thing, but I'll leave it to our, the uh, agenda uh, setters in, uh, in our chair and, and vice chair. Um, unless you want to task me with that. So did we not touch on this, not on Clay Fong in particular, but when Nuria was here earlier um, and we had sort of asked to have, uh, Ryan, of course you, you were the one driving it and I don't want to misquote you, um, but trying to re-raise the issue of equity and transportation as a, as a concrete um, discussion in the future. That's one of the things I think that we had asked Nuria to be thinking about and trying to come back to us with. And I think that what you've just raised, Mark, would fit into that discussion. Sure. Uh, uh, yes, of course, it fits into that discussion. I, um, I think that uh, it's Clay's um, presentation and his, his work product stands on its own as a um, uh, as an interesting lesson in history and unintended consequences and uh, could be an intro to uh, a, a broad based intro to this ongoing discussion regarding uh, regarding equity. Okay, I appreciate that. And I will also confess that part of the reason this has been put on hold is again, my procrastination on the operating agreement because a good part, or whatever the rules procedure, because uh, a good, portion of the reason that we, we even embarked on that project was being unsure what to do when some members of TAB wanted to invite, you know, other people and it's not on the staff work plan and how do we shoehorn it in and what, you know, what are the guardrails for that kind of activity? So you're right, that's been on hold and it's on me. Okay. Um, <clears throat> at our upcoming, at our next meeting, I see that the pedestrian crossing topic will be will be uh, discussed and something I have advocated for in the past and would I would like us to discuss at the next meeting is rather than treating pedestrian crossings as something that gets done uh, like signalization that is something that has greater a greater degree of community involvement and community support much more like the NSMP than uh, a signalization decision that, mm -hmm. well, the book says X number of cars, hence we do it and this is how we do it. Um, I think the community could benefit from and would, when, when I'm in contact with the community about their frustrations, uh, whether, for pedestrians and cycling, uh, getting across uh, our arterials, um, I think community involvement in that decision-making process would be a great thing. So I would like that to be part of our discussion at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Okay. Number three. Number three, okay. Um, uh, at our last meeting, um, I think it was the last meeting, uh, Broadway and Rayleigh was discussed, and I um, asked about a lessons learned uh, exercise regarding Broadway and Rayleigh and that intersection. And um, as I remember it, 
Uh, Erica agreed that that was something they were going to do. I offered to attend, and I don't think that that um, invitation was extended. But if the Broadway and Rayleigh lessons learned uh, exercise has been concluded, I would like uh, it to either be discussed at a future tab meeting, or at a minimum, I would like a, um, uh, I would appreciate uh, any documentation that was produced from the lessons learned. I would like to uh, have us all be able to share in those lessons. So whether that's a future agenda topic or just an information item that's passed on to uh, the tab, um, I would like to see something of that product. Okay, Erica, do you have any response at the moment? You don't have to. No, I just, um... So Natalie was on point with that and leading that and she's out of the office right now. So I don't know exactly what has happened with it, but um, certainly we can offer lessons learned or whatever, what we've learned from that. That's what I mm -hmm. think. To the extent I recall anything in addition to that, I think that we were, because they were tied on the same uh, TIP grant funding and cycle, it was also tying together with the bike, um, the multi-use path, the on-street bike lane at Colorado on 28th. Um, so here's what I can say is that I think in just about every project we learn lessons. And so maybe we can kind of like scoop all those things up and, um, you know, give context and it's like, okay, here are these projects. This is what we learned. This is what we continue to do. This is what we would do different. So. I just don't know exactly where we're at in that debrief. And so okay. I think I suspect I, Mark's point is hoping that we don't have to relearn the same lessons each time. Yes. And, and of course, point. of course we learn if if we're if we're uh, all doing our job, we we all learn from our experiences. However, I think um, some projects uh, warrant based on cost overruns, design failures, and um, safety concerns. Uh, I think some projects warrant uh, a greater degree of attention than others. And um, this is one, again, the tab is welcome to tell me, drop it, Mark, this is not gonna happen. But in, in, in my way of my perception, this is one that warrants a serious lessons learned exercise and a, and a written product. That would be my request. Okay. I'll mull that over. We will we'll actually like frame that particular request against the draft uh, rules of procedure and see how it holds up. And I think that's gonna be a very useful sort of filter to put these new, you know, proposed procedures through. Is that is that going to satisfy people? If I think right now it would probably need the support of only one other tab member to proceed with that. And if it takes more than an hour of staff time, Eric would have to approve it. I think that's where we're at. <laughs> um, and maybe that's not a path that we want to go down, but um, thanks for that request. I think that's going to be a useful exercise uh, either for tab or <laughs> for our lessons learned, but either way, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one. Thanks. It sounds like at the moment, we don't have a, a commitment to take that anywhere. I agree with your assessment. Okay. <laughs> so just to, for clarity, are you talking about support from other TAP members or from staff? Uh, I, I, what I was trying to say is it sounds like I haven't received a commitment from you, Erica, uh, that staff would be um, preparing some kind of, you know, lessons learned and not just in a, like, hold that mental file, but in some sort of written down sort of processed document that is either discussed with TAB or just TAB is informed of it. Yeah, so now we'll definitely, you know, share it with you. I just, I don't know what, um, as I said, Natalie was on point for that. Sure. And I don't know what format things either had or will have um, in the future. So I okay. think that, you know, we can certainly share with Tab and 
you know, when you say a written form or whatever, it's like, we've got presentations, we've got all kinds of things. So we'll, we'll, we'll definitely share that, um, you know, those learnings with you. Okay. I, I don't know if it's ringing the same bells with Mark as it is with me, but for, for the Folsom Street protected bike lane, you could ask various members of staff, like what, what did we learn from that? What did we learn we shouldn't do? What, what was the problem there? And we would get 20 different answers if we asked 20, 10 different people. <laughs> um, and so maybe there's some value in having some kind of collective understanding of what went right and what went wrong and what go differently next time. And Mark is suggesting Broadway Rayleigh as a test case for that kind of, if I'm interpreting Mark's uh, request correctly. Yeah. I, I mean, what I can say is I've heard you. I gotcha. Thank you. As I said, you didn't have to have an answer. <laughs> Anything further, Tab? Other than a motion to dismiss maybe? I'll make a motion to dismiss. Brian, for the win, make some motion to dismiss. Okay. I'll second. I'm unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> All right, all in favor? Shall we adjourn? Chris came back on camera just for his last cameo of the evening. Thank you very much. We appreciate you hanging out. And not too bad, people. We were way behind and we're only eight minutes past. Good job catching up. <laughs> Thanks, all. Uh, we will, we will see you next time and probably in between. Thanks. Bye.